Deputy Speaker. Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Announcements by the Deputy Speaker. Honorable Members, Mr. Prakash Ramada, MP, Member for St. Augustine, and Mr. Ganga Singh, MP, Member for Shigonas West, have requested leave of absence from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the members seek is granted. Bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers. Minister of Finance. This one. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. The Consolidated Financial Statements of the Petroleum Company of Trinidad and Tobago Limited for the year ended September 30th, 2017 and the audited financial statements of Trinidad Nitrogen Company Limited for the year ended December 31st, 2017. I beg to move that these papers one and two be referred to the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee. Honorable members, the question is that papers one and two be referred to the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Minister of Public Administration. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have the honor to lay the 107th report of the Salary Reviews Commission of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in relation to the Office of Director, Maritime Services, Ministry of Works and Transport. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have the honor to lay paper number four, the response of the Public Service Commission to the seventh report, report of the Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory Authorities, including the THA, on an inquiry into the efficiency and effectiveness of the Public Service Commission. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Reports from committees, Prime Minister's questions, urgent questions. Member for Urupuch West. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. To the Attorney General, with respect to public concerns raised regarding the questionable sentencing of an individual involved in the seizure of 1.56 million worth of cocaine, could the Attorney General indicate whether the state has appealed this, the decision? Leader of the House. Deputy Speaker, this time the, there has been no appeal at this time. Okay. Questions on notice, questions for oral answer.
Do you have the house? No, I have it. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are nine oral questions. We will be answering five, and we kindly ask for a two-week referral of questions 230, 234, 235, and 245. Two three zero. We're asking. I repeat. Right. There are nine oral questions. We will be answering five. We are asking for a two-week deferral of questions two three zero, two three four, two three five, and two four five. Member for Urupuch West, question number 243. Thank you. Question number 243 to the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Trinidad and Tobago, Paraquat is commonly referred to as Ramoxon. Gramoxone is one of 16 brand name herbicides sold in Trinidad and Tobago containing Paraquat as an active ingredient. These trade names include Sunquat, Rays, Gramoxone Super, Wopro Super, and Weedless. Information published by the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Board states that Paraquat is a contact, non-selective herbicide used locally since its registration in 1989. It is used in agriculture to control a wide range of broad-leaved weeds, grasses, and as a defoliant. At the same time, Paraquat is reportedly used in over 40% of suicides in Trinidad and Tobago. For this reason, among others, the Local Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Act and regulations include an additional requirement in line with international standards for Paraquat to be stenched and for an emetic to be added to its ingredients before registration by the board. In addition, premises licensed by the board for the sale of Paraquat must keep a register of sales and purchases, including the basic information on the purchaser. As a class one pesticide, Paraquat must be displayed in a secured place only to which, to which the public has no free access. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the banning of the importation and distribution of Gramoxone is primarily a matter for the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Board established under Section 3 of the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Act. That board, chaired by the Chief Medical Officer, has the responsibility under Section 4 of the Act to deal with all matters relating to the importation, registration, and licensing of pesticides and toxic chemicals like Gramoxone and the cancellation of such registrations and licenses in circumstances where the board deems it fit to do so. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm advised that this matter is currently being considered by the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Board established under the Act. I thank you. Supplemental, or Puch West. Um, Honorable Minister, are you aware that 38 countries in the world have banned this product? and it cannot be decomposed. In fact, the byproduct is 1,000 times greater than the chemical itself. Minister of Agriculture, Land Mr. and Deputy Fisheries. Deputy Speaker, I'm, a, I'm aware of a lot of matters. And I repeat, this is a matter for the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Board established under the law. And I'm advised that this matter is currently being considered by the board. Supplemental, Karani East. On the host jurisdiction, the Pesticide and Control Board rests. Is it the minister, your ministry, or the ministry under the, who is for the chief medical officer? Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm sure that my colleague knows that the responsibility under the act resides with the Minister of Health, the line responsibility. But the matter of a decision rests with the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Board, as I've said on two previous occasions. 
Only, only two questions are allowed, member. I now proceed to Overpuch West, question 244. Question 244 to the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In response to paragraph A of the question, 13 poaching reports were received between January 2017 and March 2018. With regards to part B of the question, a total of 21 persons were apprehended during the same period, with seven charged a total of $6,000. Three persons have their matters ongoing in the court, while 11 persons have been cautioned. In response to Part C, the most important measure taken for the protection of the scarlet ibis is the declaration of the bird as an environmentally sensitive species under the Environmental Management Act. Other measures include programs to educate the public about the protection measures in place for the scarlet ibis and the importance of the ibis to biodiversity, conservation, and economic activity in and around the Karani Bird Sanctuary. Two, increased resources directed to law enforcement at the nesting and roosting areas. Three, increased interagency collaboration and operational activity, particularly with the Coast Guard, the EMA, Zoological Society of Trinidad and Tobago, Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, Ministry of Tourism, and other community stakeholder groups, including tour operators, and finally, advanced to work with the FAO to strengthen protected areas management system in the country and improve capacity building in the forestry division and the communities around the Karani Bird Sanctuary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank you. Um, just, just to clarify an earlier statement, it's four questions are allowed supplemental on questions and notice. So for the record, so. Yes, yes. <laughs> I okay, seeing that, seeing that I, I, I brought it back on the table, go ahead, Karenis. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, Honorable Minister, based on what you just said about the Chief Medical Officer being responsible for the pesticide and uh, control area, would you be willing to discuss with your colleague, Minister of Health, to set a policy for the cessation of the import of that? Agriculture, lands, and fisheries. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as my friend knows, having sat in a cabinet and served in a government, it is, it is for the Pesticides and Toxic Chemical Board established under the Act to make appropriate, to make appropriate recommendations to its line minister, for the line minister to make appropriate recommendations to the cabinet for the cabinet to give consideration to the recommendations, and if necessary, for the appropriate minister to bring legislation to the parliament if that becomes necessary. Thank you. Supplemental, Kearney East. So, Minister, are you telling us that the tail is wagging the dog? <laughs> and, the, and the minister has to wait for Hold, hold on, Minister of Agriculture. He has 15 seconds. To, uh, to, can you not direct the pesticide and control department to investigate and bring a, bring a, bring a matter to you for consideration? Minister, Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. Adam, Mr. Deputy Speaker, since, as I said earlier, Gramoxone was first registered in Trinidad and Tobago in 1989, as my friend is well aware, as this dog that he refers to has been growing, he had 10 years or more to deal with it. And as I said from the outset, the matter is currently being considered by the board, which has responsibility to deal with this matter. That is how it works, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The board deals with it and refers the matter to the executive. Okay, any supplemental for question 244? Yes, Honorable Minister. 
sir. The fine for the offense of poaching is, I believe, is one thousand dollars. Is there any plans to increase this fine? Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is well known, and we are currently we in, we are currently in the thirty day period, the final stage, which expires on June twenty second, twenty eighteen which deals with the period in which the public has a final opportunity to comment. And after that, the scarlet ibis will officially be declared an environmentally sensitive species for which the fine is $100,000. Question, question 247, member for Faisabad. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question 247 to the Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The answer to Part A is 258. The answer to Part B, the products and application dates for each application are as follows. January 2013, GNC Triple Strength Fish Oils Plus CoQ10. January 2013, Pantanex DR20. January 2013, Pantanex DR40. January 2013, Imelec Tablets 100 milligram. January 2013, Imelec Tablets 400 milligram. January 2013, Moxiflac Eye Drops, Ophthalmic Solution USP 0.5% weight and volume. Janu January 2013, Indostatin 40 or Simvastatin 40 milligram tablets. January 2013, Lignox 2% or Lidocaine injection BP. January 2013, MetCheck or Metformin tablets BP 850 milligrams. January 2013, Flexilor P tablets 4 milligram and 500 milligram. January 2013, Flexilor P8 tablets, 8 milligram and 500 milligram. January 2013, Flexilor SR tablets, 16 milligram. January 2013, Moflorin ophthalmic solution, 5 ml, or moxifloxacin ophthalmic solution, USP. January 2013, Nemocid oral suspension, 5 milligram. June 2013, Deprevec 75 milligram modified release tablets. June 2013, Flufenazine Deconate injection BP 25 milligram per ml. June 2013, Zafen tablets 120 milligram. June 2013, Zafen tablets 180 milligram. June 2013, Verosol or Ver Verapamil hydrochloride injection, USB, 5 milligram per 2 ml. June 2013, cortisol. June 2013, naloxone hydrochloride injection, USB, 0 0.4 milligram per ml, 1 ml ampule. June 2013, Yasnal Qtab, 5 milligram. June. June, sorry, June 2013, Yasnal Q-Tab, 5 milligram. June 2013, Yasnal Q-Tab, 10 milligram. June 2013, Cipronir uh, injection, 2 milligram per ml. June 2013, Metronir, metronidazole injection solution for infusion, 5 milligram per ml. June 2013, Levenir solution for infusion, 5 milligram per ml. June 2013, Relcel gel, mango, 180 ml. June 2013, Relcel gel, strawberry, 180 ml. June 2013, Emanera 20 milligram gastro resistant tablets. June 2013, Emanera 40 milligram gastro resistant tablets. June 2013, Oxytocin injection BP 10 IU per ml. 
June 2013, Anzevir R tablets 300 milligram and 100 milligram. June 2013, Ritanovir tablets 100 milligram. June 2013, Abasivir sulfate tablets 60 milligram. June 2013, Abasivir sulfate tablets 60 milligram and 30 milligram. June 2013, Glevo IV solution for intravenous infusion, 500 milligrams for, repeat the last one, sure. June 2013, Glevo IV solution for intravenous infusion, 500 milligram per 100 ml. June 2013, Acyclovir solution for intravenous infusion, BP 250 milligram. June 2013, adenosine injection, USP, 12 milligram per 4 ml. June 2013, Vansip 500 tablets. June 2013, IXMU eye drops. June 2013, Genvir 500. Honorable June, Member, your time has expired. Thank to you answer very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Okay, supplemental, member for Faisabad. Thank you very much, Minister, for that very comprehensive response. Um, I just wanted to get the broad picture. There are 258 drugs, and I gather that the average time for registration is about five years <coughs> coming forward, including some very important drugs. Minister, can you indicate perhaps what might be the reasons for this? Minister Thank Felt. you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is embarrassing for the member of Faisabad not to have checked with Barataria Sanwan. You see Barataria Sanwan is laughing. Between 2013 and 2015, when you were in office, there was a backlog of 629 items. The backlog is now 258. Because this Minister of Health cleared 401. Your administration had no interest in registering new drugs, absolutely none. As a matter of fact, I came to the parliament one day with 400 certificates to sign off from 2012. And Minister Young was asking me, what are you doing? I said, I am clearing off the backlog of 401 drugs from 2012. That was the backlog you left behind, honorable member for Faisabad because your administration had no interest in the health agenda. Your only solution to health was to build a children's hospital. You had absolutely no interest, and we are clearing the backlog. And of the 258 outstanding, 100 of that 258 have already been read, and will go to the Drug Advisory Committee in June of this year. Yes. 158 are being read and will go to the Drug Advisory Committee in July of this year. So by July of this year, the backlog which you left of 601 member. will be cleared. Honorable member, your time has expired. Okay. Supplemental, Faisabad. Thank you, Minister. Um, I noted that one very important drug for the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage, oxytoc oxytocin BSP, is still to be approved. Can you shed some light on that? As Minister you Felt. fully well know, Member, these... Hold one sec. Members, I would like to hear the response of the ministers, and I'll also like to hear the questions. Proceed, Minister of Health. As you fully well know, there are other brands of oxytocin on the market. This is just another brand of the same drug. So, for instance... I would have called out nemocid oral suspension. It does not mean to say there is no nemocid on the market. These are different brands or different generics of drugs already on the market. So I am quite surprised as an obstetrician of some repute, you are claiming that there is not oxytocin registered for this market. There is. Why are you asking these irrelevant questions? And you could have checked and save the member of Barataria Samwa the embarrassment of having read out into the Hansard the total indifference to not having drugs registered from 2012, which we are now doing. And let me repeat, 
There was a 629 backlog from 2013 to 2015. We have cleared off 401. Of the 258 to be cleared, 100 of those have already been read. They will go to the Drug Advisory Committee in June of this year. The other 158 are being read and will go to the Drug Advisory Committee in July of this year. So by July of this year, this administration would have cleared off the entire backlog left behind by your good selves. Thank you very much, Minister. Minister, this question arose because of the issue with the fake drugs. Can you perhaps link what impact this is having? Uh, you did mention in an article that there was, that was an issue with the fake drugs and the registration of drugs. Can you shed some light on that? Minister see, Felt. The issue of fake drug is multifaceted. One of the reasons is that when the private sector cannot get their drugs registered in a timely fashion, what will they do? They will bring in drugs which are unregistered. If you had done your work between 2012 and 2015 to register these drugs, maybe the problem may not have been this big, but the issue of fake drugs has to, has to be encapsulated with the whole issue of unregistered drugs. And there's another question being posed here today. So I want to reiterate, this administration by July of this year will have cleared off the backlog of 601 unregistered drugs because we have a functioning drug advisory committee. And I would advise the member to please check with the member Baratharia Sawa before you ask these embarrassing questions. Question 249, member for Faisabad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number 248 to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In some instances, the drug may be not registered but are obtained through sources such as the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO Strategic Fund. Drugs acquired through this source are on the PAHO WHO pre-qualified list of medicines and are used internationally, such as medications for tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria. In other instances, the Ministry of Health acquires drugs that may not be registered locally, but they have been validated by international agencies such as the United States of America Drug um, Agency, Food and Drug Administration, and the European Union. In all instances, pharmacovigilance is practiced to allow for the reporting of adverse events in the use and possible recall of all pharmaceuticals by the Food and Drugs Division and the Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Supplemental member for Faisabad. Thank you, Minister, um, for that answer. I was just wondering whether the drug Duratocin, which is now used... The drug what? Duratocin, mm -hmm. which is now being used for postpartum hemorrhage, whether that um, is getting consideration for registration or whether it has been registered. I don't know if you'd be in a position to answer that. I Minister of Health. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, all drugs, as I have said, we inherited a backlog of 629 drugs to be registered. It is possible that is one that is under the aegis of the Chief Medical Officer. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, the issue of the use of un unregistered drugs locally in the public health system has been going on for decades especially in the case of malaria. That has been going on for over 20 years. I must, I must also put on the record that many countries, out of the doctrine of necessity and for public health, may use at their discretion drugs which are not registered or which are experimental. For example, right now, in the um, Democratic Republic of Cong Congo, they are using uh, an experimental Ebola vaccine which has not undergone any serious clinical trials to save lives. That vaccine is called RVSV Zebov Ebola vaccine. So very often countries out of the doctrine of necessity and to protect public health will make a decision to use an unregistered drug on a local po population. I thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Supplemental, yeah. Minister, thank you, Minister Fai Member so for Faisabad. In that situation, you are saying that the RHAs, for example, cannot use that as an excuse for not purchasing such drugs. 
In the situation where the drugs are necessary, the RHAs will not be in a position to use the excuse of not being registered to get those drugs available. The RHAs will go through the chief medical officer to get his advice. Question 249, member for Faisabad. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question 249 to the Minister of Health. Minister Again, of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The answer to part A, the annual number of successful applicants for the Children's Life Fund from its, from its inception to date is as follows. 2010, 13, 2011, 38, 2012, 20, 2013, 38, 2014, 28, 2015, 34, 2016, 40, 2017, 31, and to April of 2018, 12, giving you a total of 252. The list of medical conditions which were granted approval from the Children's Life Fund from its inception to date include open heart surgical repair, kidney transplant, liver transplant, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, Aspert's syndrome, retinoblastoma, neurofibromatosis, vesico-rectal fistula, Gaucher's disease, esophageal atresia. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Member for Princess Town. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's members, the Minister. Uh, hold on. Members, please, it's early in the sitting, and again, I will not tolerate the crosstalk on both sides between member for Separia and member for Lavantil West. Please, I recognize Prince Sister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, to Honorable Minister, in light of the recent call to review the Children's Life Fund legislation by the leader of the opposition, with a view of reviewing the conditions that meet the criteria presently, could the minister indicate whether this call is being considered by the ministry and the cabinet in light of several children who are affected with conditions that are not included? Oh, what happened Minister Phil, no. Listen, listen. <laughs> listen, members, the decorum of the house has to be maintained. No two ways about it, members. It has to be maintained. Right, I recognize Princess Stong. Princess Stong, question, have your seat, and then I will proceed to get your question answered. The cross talk, let's avoid it, especially in, in, in loud overtones. So I recognize member, Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In direct answer to my colleague's question, the Children's Life Fund was set up to give children who have life-threatening conditions an opportunity at life. The Children's Life Fund legislation as currently constructed gives all children born with life-threatening conditions, life-threatening problems, a chance of life. If it is you want to include non-life-threatening conditions, it opens a Pandora's box and then the very children who you want to save with life-threatening conditions, and the member for Faisabad is nodding ahead in agreement. If you do what you are suggesting, the fund will be depleted in treating non-life-threatening conditions. And the member of Faisabad is in full agreement with me. Thank you very much. Member for Prince Stone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, I'm not sure if you're aware, but several RHA doctors have written and provided information with respect to recommendations of other conditions that do not fit the criteria presently by the Children's Life Fund legislation. And having identified those conditions by your own RHA Question, doctors, please. could you indicate whether or not there is going to be a review of this process? That's all I'm simply asking. Minister of Health. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think the member for Faisabad and myself are in agreement with this. If you open up the Children's Life Fund, because he was nodding in agreement when I'm saying, 
if you open up the children's life fund to non-threatening conditions, the very children that you want to save when the funds are depleted may not have an opportunity currently being given by the Children's Life Fund. We have to be careful how we open a Pandora's box, which we cannot manage and control. I thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. To the Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, are you then saying that you do not agree with several of these RHA doctors that they have conditions that are life-threatening that do not fall in the current ambit of the present legislation. And they have written recommendations to this effect under your tenure. Minister of Health. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Act speaks for life-threatening conditions. And my friend just admitted, if they are life-threatening, they will receive the consideration and the necessary funding. You are contradicting your own self. Once the condition is deemed life-threatening by the clinical team, by the life fund, as set up under the Act, the children will, in fact, receive funding. When you look at the Hansard and look at the intention of Parliament and reflect on Pepper v. Hart, the Hansard speaks to surgeries, procedures, and that is what is deemed to be saving a child with a life-threatening condition. And the very children that we are saving now, I will repeat it again. If you make the fund way too broad, the funding will be depleted, and the very children who have a life-threatening condition that you may want to save, you may not have the funding to do so. And may I also add that this fund is funded directly by the taxpayer of this country, and the taxpayer demands some accountability. Silence. So we will continue to, to use this fund according to the Act, the spirit and law of this Act, for life-threatening conditions. And I'm being asked how much I have contributed. Do you know how much my friends have contributed since they have gone into opposition? None. They were only concerned, they were only concerned Silence. while they were in government for PR use. But once they go into opposition, they have contributed zero dollars and zero cents to the Children Life Fund. I recognize the member for Princess Town. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Princess Mr. Deputy Town. Mr. Deputy Speaker, seeing that the Honourable Member for St. Joseph has admitted himself that he has not contributed to the Life Fund or any of their own members, question. the question remains, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the question remains, is the Minister indicating that he does not agree with medical doctors in this country who belong to the RHA, that there are conditions that affect children, several children, that are life-threatening but do not fall within the ambit, and therefore there needs to be a review. The Chris, member for St. Joseph is not a doctor. I will, member, member, I will not entertain that question. I will not entertain that question. Request for leave to move the, the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance statements by ministers, personal explanations, introduction of bills, the Tax Information Exchange Agreements Bill 2018 in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that in accordance with Standing Order 641C, the Tax Information Exchange Agreements Bill 2018 be referred to the Joint Select Committee established for the consideration and report on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018 and the Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Bill 2018. Honorable Members, the question is that in accordance with Standing Order 641C, the Tax Information Exchange Agreements Bill 2018 be referred to the Joint Select Committee 
established for the consideration and report on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018 and the Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Bill 2018. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Motions relating to the business or settings of the House and moved by a minister. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, subject to the concurrence of the Senate, I beg to move that this House appoint the following six members to sit with an equal number from the Senate on the Joint Select Committee established to consider and report on the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Bill 2018. Mr. Colum Imbert, Mr. Faris al rawi Mr. Terence Dialsing, Mr. Adrian Leons, Mr. Barry Padarath, Mr. Rudranath Indar Singh. I also ask that the committee be mandated to report by July 31st, 2018. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Honorable members, subject to the concurrence of the Senate, the question is that this House appoint the following six members to sit with an equal number from the Senate on the Joint Select Committee established to consider and report on the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Bill 2018. Mr. Com Imber, Mr. Faris Alwari, Mr. Terence Dialsing, Mr. Adrian Leontz, Mr. Barry Padarat, Mr. Rudranath Indar Singh, and that the committee be mandated to report by July 31st, 2018. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, subject to the concurrence of the Senate, I beg to move that this House appoint the following six members to sit with an equal number from the Senate on the Joint Select Committee established to consider and report on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018, the Mutual As Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Bill 2018, and the Tax Information Exchange Agreements Bill 2018. Mr. Colum Imbert, Mr. Faris al Rawi, Mr. <laughs> Ms. Marlene McDonald, <laughs> Dr. Lovell Francis, Mr. Fazal Karim, Mr. Rodney Charles. I also move that the committee be mandated to report by June 30th, 2018. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Honorable members, subject to the concurrence of the Senate, the question is that this House appoint the following six members to sit with an equal number from the Senate on the Joint Select Committee established to consider and report on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018, the Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Bill 2018, and the Tax Information Exchange Agreements Bill 2018. Mr. Com Imbe, Mr. Faris Alwari, Ms. Marlene McDonald, Dr. Lovell Francis, Mr. Fazal Karim, Mr. Rodney Charles, and the committee be mandated to report by June 30th, 2018. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any against? The ayes have it. Public business, government business, motions. Minister of Finance. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move 
with the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved that the Senate amendments to the Evaluation of Land Amendment Bill 2018, listed in Appendix 1, be now considered. Honorable members, the question is that the Senate amendments to the Evaluation of Land Amendment Bill 2018, listed in Appendix 1, to the order paper be now considered. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. All right. Um, members, is it the wish of the House that the items be taken one by one, or could we take it as what's the, what's the wish of the House, Leader of the House, and Chief Whip? So that's the wish, one by one. It doesn't matter. One by one. Five, delete subsection five and substitute with the following. Five, the minister may by order, subject to ne negative resolution of parliament, amend schedule two. Now, honorable members, honorable members, for the records, again, we will be dealing specifically with each particular clause, right? We will not be wavering too much to the left or too much to the right as we go along. So as the speaker, I will determine as we go along. So let's be very specific with the particular clause. Leader of the House and also Chief Whip. Proceed. I will help you. Minister of Finance. I waiting for him to call him. Don't make joke with that. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that this House agree with the Senate in the amendment to Clause 5. And the amendment read as, reads as follows. Delete Clause 5 and substitute with the following. Sorry, delete subsection 5 and substitute with the following. 5. The Minister may by order subject to negative resolution of Parliament amend Schedule 2. Now, the original Section 5 simply said the Minister may by order, the, the original subsection 5 originally said the Minister may by order amend Schedule 2. And we on this side felt that the, any amendments to the schedule should have some level of parliamentary scrutiny so that we amended with the concurrence of the Senate this particular clause to allow instead of the minister simply having the power to issue an order without parliamentary oversight to amend the schedule, schedule two, that this would now be subject to negative resolution of parliament. And let me say what schedule two is. Schedule two is simply the return required under section six of the Evaluation of Land Act which has in it personal information with respect to a property owner, uh, general information in terms of the location of the property, its address, when was it purchased, whether it was subject of a deed, a title deed, and um, what type of building it is, residential, etc., commercial, industrial. So Schedule 2 is simply the information in the return that property owners are required to submit to the Commissioner of Valuations. And the bill that was passed in the House simply gave the Minister the power to amend this schedule with the information on the property without any parliamentary oversight. And we felt that this should be laid in Parliament so that if Honourable Members opposite felt that there was need to debate it, they would file the usual motion and we'd have a debate on it. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move. Honorable, one second. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments of Clause 5 of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. Honorable members, okay, member for Separia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
Um, the amendment is a good one to give parliamentary scrutiny. We would have preferred that you had a affirmative resolution instead of negative resolution. Um, I doubt you will consider that. I know it was raised in the Senate, but it, this is an improvement from what was there before. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. In fact, this was some, a consensus arrived at between myself and the goodly leader of opposition business in the Senate, Senator Wade Mark. And I accept what you say, but it is definitely an improvement. I beg to move. Did I, did I hear beg to move, sir? Yes, sir. Well, say it audibly enough. For... I beg to move. <laughs> Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 5 of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Clause 6. A. Delete proposed new section 7 and substitute the following. 7. Where the owner of land in Trinidad and Tobago makes a return of land under section 6 and the commissioner is of the opinion on the basis of that return that the land carries an annual rental value of less than $18,000, he shall record the annual rental value as $18,000. B. Delete Propose new section 7A1 and substitute the following. 7A1, where the commissioner is of the view that more than 50% of the land in Trinidad and Tobago has been valued and that the valuation should take effect, he shall notify the minister in writing. Minister, minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 6. And essentially, in the amendments to Clause 6, we are putting, we are deleting what is in the bill and substituting it with a new version. But the operational or effective words in this are the words in writing. So if one goes to 7A, where the commission is of the view that more, that more than 50% of all land in Trinidad and Tobago has been valued and that devaluation should take effect, he shall notify the minister in writing. In the previous version, the version that was passed in the House, it read as follows. Where the commissioner is of the view that more than 50% of all land in Trinidad and Tobago has been valued, and evaluation should take effect, he shall notify the minister. But there was no proper way to notify the minister. So we have now decided to add for the avoidance of doubt that the commissioner would notify the minister once 50% of the land has been valued in writing. And basically, that is it. With respect to the section 7 itself, what this would mean with an annual rental value of $18,000, the property tax would be somewhere in the vicinity of about $35 a month, somewhere around there. That is the effect. That would be the minimum property tax payable. It would be $35 per month. I beg to move. Me member for Carney Central. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on this particular matter, having to do with the determination of 50% of land ownership being covered by the legislation and therefore triggering the taxes Is the Minister of Finance aware that there's a United Nations report which indicates that 25% of the land ownership in this country is in contest because of squatters, first of all, and these are both on public and private lands? And is he also aware 
that that same report indicates that 50% of the owners of land in the country do not have their titles finalized. What this means is that in a country of 450,000 households, you have 25% of that perhaps under the ownership, not ownership, but under the occup occupation of squatters. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I hate to do this, 48 the only change we've made to the bill is that it's it's in writing. So the only thing we should be debating is whether the notification to the minister should be in writing or not in writing, not the other part of it, not the substantive bill, which is what the honorable member is doing. No. The question, the question would be, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it, whether this is determined by the minister as it was in the original bill or whether it is now determined on a recommendation by the Commissioner for State Lands. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the only changes the words in writing. It is not, has nothing to do with the Parent Act or the Amendment Bill. It is simply to add the words in writing. 48 No, okay. Member for Karani Central, mm -hmm. right? I want to, you, you, you started your, 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 dis, your discourse, right? I want to know exactly where you are heading to in order to determine exactly based on the point being raised by the Minister of Finance. So I want you to tie it in quickly in order to determine whether it is that you're relevant or whether you will be irrelevant. Consider. Thank you very much. All right, so tie it in quickly for me, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, what I'm concerned about is for, what is the whole out of which 50% is going to be determined in order to put this in writing? Right. Mr. Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I don't think the Honorable Member followed what I was saying. The only change, and I will just read the two forms. 7A1, where the Commissioner is of the view that more than 50% of all land in Trinidad and Tobago has been valued, and that evaluation should to take effect, he shall notify the Minister. So it is not the Minister is notifying anybody. It is the Commissioner is notifying the minister. And all this amendment seeks to do is to make sure that when the commissioner notifies the minister, he does so in writing. So the only thing we can debate is whether it should be in writing or should not be in writing. I beg to move. Honorable members, the question is that this house Members, honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 6 of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. Honorable members, all in favor, say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Clause 13. Delete Clause 13 and substitute the following. 13. Section 21 of the Act is amended by deleting the words Tax Appeal Board wherever they occur and substituting the words Valuation Tribunal and B by inserting after subsection 2 the following new subsection. 3. Upon application by an owner or local authority for an extension of time to give notice of appeal under subsection 1, the Valuation Tribunal may extend the, the time prescribed to give notice of appeal on any terms and conditions as it thinks fit. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to close 13. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, just to make it crystal clear exactly what we're doing here, the new Clause 13 or the substituted Clause 13 is identical to the one before. The only thing we are changing, the only thing we are changing, with the exception, it's identical to the one before, with the exception of the following. What we are doing is that we are giving a, an aggrieved person the ability to 
seek an extension of time from the valuation of tribunal if they wish to appeal a valuation of land, the assessment of the valuation of land, the value of a, of a piece of land. If they wish to appeal the assessment done by the commissioner of valuations, at the present time, they have 30 days. So what we're doing is we're adding this upon application by an owner or local authority for an extension of time to give notice of appeal under subsection one. The valuation tribunal may extend the time prescribed to give notice of appeal on any terms and conditions as it thinks fit. We thought this would be helpful because currently an aggrieved person has 30 days to appeal a valuation done by the Commissioner of Valuations, and we felt there might be quite a few people might not be able to make that 30 days for one reason or another. They may not have the resources to lodge an appeal as the case may be. So in those circumstances, the Valuation Tribunal is now being given the power to extend the time for an appeal on terms and conditions as it thinks fit. I beg to move. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 13 of the Valuation Minister of Finance. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 13 of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. Honorable, no, like I paused to allow, to allow and, and nobody. <laughs> Members, I, I would have paused. Right? So can I proceed? <laughs> Honorable members, the question is that this House agree, <laughs> this House agree with the Senate in the amendments of Clause 13 of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? No. The ayes have it. Clause 15. A. In proposed section 25, delete subsections 2 and 3 and substitute the following new subsections. 2. The valuation, the valuation tribunal shall consist of A. A chairperson who shall be an attorney at law with at least 10 years' experience as an attorney at law, and B, four other persons appointed by the president, two of whom shall have qualifications and experience in the valuation of property. Three, the chairperson of the valuation tribunal shall be appointed by the president on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Services Commission established under the, the Judicial and Legal Service Act. Four, at any meeting of the Valuation Tribunal, a quorum is constituted if at least three members are present. B. In proposed section 25, renumber. In, in proposed section 25A, renumber subsection 4 as subsection 5. C. Delete proposed section 25B and substitute the following new section. Suspension or removal of a member of the Valuation Tribunal, 25B, 1. The President, in his discretion, may suspend the, chairman, the chairperson of the Valuation Tribunal from office on the ground of his misbehavior or physical or mental incapacity or, or for cause. 2. The President may suspend a member of the Valuation Tribunal other than the chairperson from the office on the ground of misbehavior or physical or mental incapacity or for cause. Three, where the chairperson of the valuation tribunal becomes bankrupt, applies to take the benefit of any law for the relief of bankrupt or insolvent debtors, compounds with his credit creditors or makes an assignment of his remuneration for their benefit, he shall be removed by the president acting in his own discretion. Four, where a member of the valuation tribunal other than the chairperson becomes bankrupt, applies to take the benefit of any law for the relief of bankrupt or insolvent debtors,
compounds with his creditors or makes an assignment of his remuneration for their benefit, the president shall remove him from office. D. Delete proposed section 25C and substitute the following new section. Resignation of member of the valuation tribunal. 25C1. The chairperson of the valuation tribunal may resign his office in writing delivered to the president. 2. A member of the valuation tribunal other than the chairperson may resign his office in writing delivered to the chairperson. E. In proposed section 25D, in paragraph C, delete all the words after the word resigns. F. In proposed section 25H, delete paragraph B and renumber the paragraphs accordingly. Mr. Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 15. Now, with respect to this amendment made in the other place, Mr. Deputy Speaker, after listening to a um, very um, detailed arguments presented by all members on the other side, both opposition and independent, what we sought to do was to do a mix between the industrial court appointments and the tax appeal board appointments. At the present time, the chairman of the industrial court, or is it the president? President, president? president of the industrial court is appointed by the president in his or her discretion on the advice of the GLSE. Yes, that's correct. And similarly, the tax appeal board. So what we decided to do is to remove from the cabinet and remove from the minister the ability to select the chairperson of the valuation tribunal, and we mirror the arrangements currently in place for the industrial court and the tax appeal board, where, firstly, the chairperson shall be an attorney of law with at least 10 years' experience, and secondly, the chairperson shall be appointed by the president on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Services Commission. Se similarly, if you go down the amendment, the president in his discretion, which means again, this is neither cabinet nor minister involved, may suspend the chairperson of the evaluation tribunal from office on the ground of misbehavior or physical or mental incapacity or for cause, and so on. We also increase the size of the commission, we listened, because previously, I think it's three. If, if I go to close, the original clause 15, it, the tribunal was three people, and we felt we should have more than three to have a proper quorum. So we now have a quorum being constituted with at least three members. So we increase the, the tribunal to five to accommodate that. And now basically what we decided to do was rather than get into any contentious argument over this, we would mirror the tax appeal board and the industrial court appointments in terms of the chairperson being appointed and also removed by the president. The other amendments are simply administrative. I beg to move, Mr. Deputy President. Honorable members, the question is, that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 15 of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. I recognize Member for Separia. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I know we had a lot of uh, controversy with respect to Part 3A, which is um, the clauses being now considered in this House and in the other place. And this really represents a, a tremendous improvement because what you had before was a minister, and the minister was then being empowered to do something that be, what do you say, some kind of legal judicial function, quasi-judicial function, so that this, I think, goes a long way in improving. But Minister, since, um, if I may crave your indulgence, I'm speaking on the, the said amendment, I crave your indulgence, you know, how come these laws are not yet in force, the amendments to the property and the land function, but they're taking up valuations and so on? I've seen a uh, statement being made out of the office of the Prime Minister. So I'm just craving your indulgence if you can answer that because it seems, it seems um, so you're working on the old law for the moment or what about all these amendments that we have made to both statutes? 
Speaker. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, just a few points to raise on the matter and really to seek clarification more than anything else on these matters. Um, the Valuation Tribunal in the entire scheme plays a very critical role in the administration of the taxes and the new regime. The Valuation Tribunal, just to remind ourselves because we are looking at the composition of this tribunal, so it is very good to remind ourselves what is this tribunal going to do, having now to reflect on the composition. No, but honorable Here member, honorable members, 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 one sure. second. We would have ventilated all of that information, both in this house and the other place, at length. Right? We are coming back with the amendments. So in terms of the composition and so on, you know, bring it in quickly sure. in order for me to determine how how much leeway I will give you, please. Okay, sure. Mr. 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 Huh? Yes. Mr. Mr. Deputy Chairman, just to say that the Valuation Tribunal plays a critical role in hearing appeals and taking all steps necessary and reasonable to settle objections in terms of um, uh, conflict and in terms of appeals and so on, depending on persons concerned with the valuation of their lands and property and so on. To get to the point here now, you have the minister coming to the House and making the amendment because, as the minister said, presumably... There was some argument about the role of the minister in appointing the valuation tribunal in the amendment bill, correct? So the minister has made a change, and on the surface, it appears to be a good change, but I just want the minister to clarify something. A chairperson who shall be an attorney at law, 10 years experience, that is fine. The minister introduced this issue of the industrial court model, and I just want to raise a couple of points with that. Four other, apart from the chairperson, there are four other persons appointed by the president. Are these persons appointed by the president on his own, when he says her own discretion? Or does this mean appointed by the president means appointed by the cabinet? cabinet yeah. I just need to be very certain of that at this stage. This is, this is um, the president, the cabinet. It, so that it may well be that this is to be appointed by the president in her sole discretion. I think that is what the minister is advancing. And if that is what the minister is advancing, we welcome that. But if that is not what the minister is advancing, we unwelcome that. Because what it means is that the cabinet appoints four other persons. I could be wrong. But the cabinet appoints four other persons, two of whom shall have qualifications and experience in the valuation of property. That is fine, and we can discuss some other time, I guess, what it would be a qualification and experience in the valuation of property. Maybe they are, you know, they are qualifications in science and so on there. But I'm also going to raise the point, two of whom, there are two other persons to be named. Uh, two. Are these two persons to have no qualifications of any kind? Because clearly they don't need qualifications and experience in valuation of property. They may be qualified in any other area or unqualified in any other area. They could be, you know, somebody from the general council of the party or so on, anybody. And when you continue Remember, there, the chairperson of the... Oh. Again, I have heard that already. I have heard those comments, right, sitting in this chair with regards to your deliberations. Again, I want you to tighten quickly. I'm giving you the opportunity. I want you to tighten quickly with regards to the amendment that we are discussing. Sure. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you would agree with me that the amendment in the property and the valuation of land amendment bill is new. It was not there in the parent act. And therefore, the, this f fundamental change now requires a discussion by itself almost. But let me go back to the black and white of the amendment in my hand, because I think everybody would be comfortable with me doing that. So the, the four persons, two qualifications and experience, and two others we do not know anything in law as to what their qualifications may or may not be. I think that is clear. Now, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, the, the minister himself, not me, the minister, raised that question of the industrial court. But the industrial court has a, a, an important setup that has been the subject of criticism over many years. And that is, if you model after the industrial court, you are saying that, the, that a person is to be appointed would that person be appointed for a fixed term? 
or is that person appointed for, as in the case of the industrial court, a decision taken at cabinet or so for three years or five years, five years. as the case may be. And that person who is appointed for three years or five years as a member of the industrial court, it is called a member, that person is subject to the women fancy of the cabinet and may or may not continue as a member of the industrial court. So that a person on this valuation tribunal, right, finds himself or herself there, like Samaraj, find himself or herself there, is how long are they staying? Is it an appointment for life? I doubt it is. And they're proposing that the appointment will be an appointment for life in the absence of anything else. But if it's an appointment by cabinet, then cabinet can revoke that appointment as well, or they can decide not to <laughs> extend an appointment. The clarification is what we seek because um, we are not seeing it here. Mr. Deputy Speaker, 48-1, we are not amending the section of the bill which gives the term as up to three years. We are not amending that. That is not an amendment coming from the Senate. So the bill as approved by the House says that the member shall be appointed for up to three years. We are not amending that. So all of those comments about for life and so on are not relevant to the amendment, okay. as he knows. Okay, so member, in terms of that, can you move on yeah. if, you, if you have another okay. point? Could I ask the minister, therefore, is the fundamental difference between the amendment bill and your amendment you brought this afternoon that you have inserted the president and removed the minister, but by doing that, the president in this case means the cabinet, which effectively means the minister, and it makes no fundamental difference at all. Is that the situation? The other matter, suspension or removal of a member of the evaluation tribunal and so on. Again, the, but this time the minister is very careful to point out, in this case, when he made his two, three minute speech, that the president in his own discretion or in his discretion. So it is clear for the suspension or removal of a member the president, in his discretion, may suspend the chairperson and so on. But the person at the top for appointment, they don't, they don't put appointed by the president in his discretion. So you understand what has happened there? You move from the left hand to the right hand. The president may suspend a member of the evaluation tribunal other than the chairperson for, on the office, their grounds and so on, and those things are there. Where a member of evaluation becomes bankrupt, we, we clear on what that means. Resign his office in writing, delivered to the president. Well, these things are things. But the, the fundamental issue, I'll ask the minister to clarify now for us, is did you just pull a big hoax on us by saying it's not the minister, it's the president, and it's effectively the cabinet, and the minister in the first. And given the critical role that this tribunal plays, I believe if I am correct, this is another mockery of the entire process. Mrs. Davis, you can take Thank you, Mr. Attorney Deputy General. Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am alarmed, I am shocked, I'm, I, it's, it's beyond surprise to hear the submission of the learned member for Oropooch East. Let me explain why. Not only is the honorable member a qualified attorney at law, not only did the honorable member sit in the position of leader of government business, but the honorable member has the amendments in his hands. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, when the Honourable Member uses words like, is this pulling a big hoax and alleging some inflammatory remarks and motives on the part, not of the Honourable Minister, but of the entire Senate, which the opposition sits in itself, the Honourable Member fails to point to page 2, to subclause 3 of the very amendments before us. And let me read it into the record to show the level of irresponsibility from an intellectual perspective on the part of the Honorable Member for Rupuchis. Listen to this. The chairman of the Valuation Tribunal shall be appointed by the president on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Services Commission established under the Judicial and Legal Services Act. So when the Honorable Member stands to say, is the Honorable Member, the Minister of Finance, just pulling a hoax on the country, for heaven's sake, at least have the credibility to refer to the argument as it is painted in black and white in the Senate amendments. And let me state the law for the record. The amendment before the Senate today 
seeks to disaggregate before the House today, the Senate amendments, seeks to disaggregate two classifications of persons who will populate the Valuation Tribunal. One, a chairman who is backed by the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, which is a feature of the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago in terms of constitutional protection, and four other members. Take your time. You had your time. Hold on. And four other members appointed by the president. The Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago by a conjoint operation between Section 76 and Section 80 of the Constitution is pellucidly clear that that refers to the advice of cabinet. It is also, it is also pellucidly clear by the Privy Council and Court of Appeal dicta and I heard the Honorable Members opposite referring to the Samaraj case. The Samaraj case is on point where members of the opposition should know, ought to know, that the... Member, please, not tolerate any shouting across the chamber. Right? We have procedures. Use them accordingly. Thank you. AG. Mr. Deputy Speaker, where members opposite know very well that by way of example and modeling for this type of amendment, which the Senate has asked us to consider, that there is absolutely nothing wrong. There is no hoax to be carried out in the cabinet having the say-so of appointment to members of a tribunal of this nature. And the Sam Maraj dicta was absolutely clear in saying that it is precisely because of the specialist nature of these bodies that a mix and match of appointments can be had. And further, our own Court of Appeal was absolutely clear to say that there should be no odium on the cabinet having the direction to Her Excellency, in this case the President, as she now sits, by way of a decision as to appointment or revocation of members. So there is absolutely no hoax to be perpetuated. That hoax, if it were to be accepted, would have to be a hoax by the entire Senate upon this Honorable House, which I could not accept. And the Honorable Member seeks to conflate arguments in a rather dangerous fashion. There is a backing of the Judicial and Legal Services Commission. There's a constitutional backing for the position of the Chairman. The Chairman sits as the effective President of the Court in a de jure basis. The members being appointed in the fashion as they are effectively by the cabinet is well within keeping of the industrial court formula, and the honorable members know that. But you see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is just an attempt at gallery and filibuster. We know that the honorable members opposite do not support the concept of taxation from property. We know that. That debate has come and gone. The fact is, this amendment, as we treat with it, Relevance. Overrule. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'll wrap up quickly on this point. The danger in the arguments coming from those opposite is that there is some impropriety in the recommendations of the entire Senate to this House. The fact is that the Honorable Member very conveniently skipped past subclause 3, which treats with the Judicial and Legal Services Commission having the backing of the position of the President of that court, if one puts it that way, the Chairman. It is exactly in keeping with the formula done by the Industrial Court. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the Member for Kearney Central. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the presentation by the Attorney General, which he said was meant to clarify, turned out to be a discourse in genuine confusion. <laughs> because the issue that the member for Oropuch East raised was not whether the Senate 
was seeking to present a hoax to this honorable house. But whether the Minister of Finance, in making the clear statement, which we can find in Hansard now if we look, that this is, these, all these appointments are going to be presidential appointments, suggesting that they were presidential appointments in the discretion of the president, or if we use the first instance of the appointment as the chairman with the advice of the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, and he suggested, that is to say the Minister of Finance, that these appointments, all of them, would be of that kind and did not require the say-so of cabinet. It is that issue that the member for Oropooch East raised. And it is that issue that the attorney, attorney general got up to obfuscate and to confuse. And that is, it is not right for an attorney general to do that in the short submission that he made. The issue that therefore remains, and we need to clarify in this amendment, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that this document here says the amendment to the valuation tribunal shall consist of a chairperson who shall be an attorney at law with at least 10 years' experience as an attorney at law. And it then goes on to say in three, the chairperson of the valuation tribunal shall be appointed by the president on the advice of the Judicial Legal and Legal Services Commission established under the Ju Judicial and Legal Service Act. So that is very clear, and we understand that appointment. In B, however, it says, four other persons appointed by the president, two of whom shall have qualifications and experience in the valuation of property. But there is no subsequent clause which says, that, which clarifies whether the appointment shall be the president acting on advice of the judicial and legal Services Commission, as is contained here in three, nor is there, as there is in the next clause, 25B, in his discretion between two commas. And that is the source of the difficulty for us on this side, because we already have seen that you have moved from the BIR to, sorry, not the BIR, the, the um, the, the um, commission the, the, of, of the BIR um, to this particular um, institution, which is a new creation of appointment, which, if it remains under the jurisdiction of the Minister of Finance, insofar as Cabinet recommends to the President what we are going to have is a tribunal of five in which four are going to be appointed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by the cabinet. The quorum is three. And therefore, it is possible in such a situation that if political appointees are on the committee, there can be a situation in the tribunal where political influ influence can prevail. These are the issues we are raising, Deputy Speaker. And if the Minister of Finance is correct that this is meant to be an appointment that is presidential in the discretion of the president, then we ask on this side that in his discretion or in his slash her discretion be now included and added to the amendment which exists in, in a new, it would have to be a new four, making the, new, making the existing four five. 
So that is our position because e either the, the position of the minister is clear or the mo position of the minister is wrong. And if the, minister of the if the minister's position, that's to say Minister of Finance, is clear, then we want the amendment to include in his or her discretion by His Excellency, Her Excellency, the President. Thank you very much. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, one of the problems with this debate on this amendment is that some of the members opposite see things that don't exist, and some of the members opposite hear things that were never said. So let me try to deal with these things that members see that don't exist. The Honorable Member for Oropooch East saw somewhere, either in the amendment bill itself, or in the list of amendments, or in the parent act, he saw somewhere, the Honorable Member saw somewhere, that the members of the Valuation Tribunal can be appointed for life. I don't know how and where and when he saw that, but he had a long fulmination, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Like he fulminated at length about how these members of the Evaluation Tribunal would be appointed for life. Let me read, let me read the Bill House of Representatives as amended in the House and, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know when I'm correcting the mischief of members opposite, they like to interrupt me. So I would seek your protection when they attempt to interrupt me. So the Honorable Member for Oropochi saw something that did not exist, that members of the Evaluation Tribunal will be appointed for life. I shall read Clause 9, 4 of the amendment bill before us, and it reads as follows. A member of the Valuation Tribunal shall hold office for a term not exceeding three years, nah. as is specified in his instrument of appointment. Lord. So therefore, all of that carrying on and all of that carrying on about how we'll be appointing members of the Valuation Tribunal for life was simply based on mischief. It's uh, sure, of course, of course, of course. I understand that what has happened, and 425 before does in fact give a, a, a term, uh, but it, something doesn't appear to be right, and I'm seeking clarity. In your amendment, page 12 of this uh, for the people, you have said to, in section 25A, which is clause 15 we are dealing with, in proposed 25A, delete two and three and substitute the following new yes, subsections. Correct. So you have subsection two, subsection three, yeah. and you have four. Four remains. Good. And then you renumber four, yes, the existing right. four you're reading, into five. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Yes, clarify. Of course. Thank you very much. The, the leader of the opposition has further crystallized the point. Crystallized the point. When the Honorable Member for Oro Pooch East was fulminating with his fake information, uh, it's unfortunate that the Leader of the Opposition did not assist the Honorable Member and show him that the Member shall hold office for a term not exceeding three years. So the Honorable Member for Oro Pooch East saw something Silence that didn't on both exist. sides. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for quelling the noise. And now we go to what the Member for Sugar Quarren Essential heard that was never said. What, what I said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was very, very clear that we were using a model similar to the Tax Appeal Board. That's what I said. I never said anything about presidential in his or her discretion. Those words never came out of my mouth. Never. What I said is we used a model similar to the exist. No, I have to make myself clear because honorable members on your side honorable leader, do not hear when people speak. So maybe you need to raise the decibel level so that what I said, honorable deputy speaker, to the honorable member for Carney Central was that we were using a model based on the tax appeal board yeah. configuration and the industrial court configuration. Right. I will now, Use my microphone. I will now read, thank you, I will now read the configuration for the existing tax appeal board something that has been in existence in this country for 
I can't imagine how many years. 50 years. Let's, let's, let's read. The chairman and vice chairman of the appeal board shall be attorney of law. The chairman and vice chairman shall be appointed by the president acting in accordance with the advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. So again, that's another thing that the honorable member for Arpochi saw that didn't exist. The existing tax appeal board, the chairman, vice chairman, shall be appointed by the president acting with the advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. And then it goes on to say, the members of the appeal board, other than the chairman and vice chairman, shall be appointed by the president, which means cabinet, from among members as appear to the president, which means cabinet to be qualified by virtue of various skills, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So the existing tax appeal board has a chairman and a vice chairman appointed by the president, Her Excellency, the president, His Excellency, on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission, every other member is appointed by the cabinet. That has been the case in this country for 50 years. And, and the difference between the difference between our valuation tribunal and the tax appeal board is that in its current configuration, the government could appoint any number of persons that it wishes to the tax appeal board. Just like the central bank. You could put 100 persons appointed by the cabinet and therefore dilute the influence of the chairman and deputy chairman they, they appointed by the president. For 50 years, that has been the situation. So what we did, we looked at it and we said, no, we should not use the tax appeal board model in toto. Because if we did, we'd have made the number of valuation tribunal members appointed by the cabinet unlimited. We said, no, we won't do that. So we made it five. And instead of having an unlimited number of members appointed by the cabinet, as is the status quo, as it is now, has been for 50 years, we say with four. And we said to, we'll qualify two of them as being qualified in, in, in valuation, and the other two would be, would be persons, lay persons. And that is the way the world is going, Mr. Deputy Speaker. For your information, the Judicial Commission in England has persons who are, have, are legally qualified, and it has lay people on it. That is the way of the world. And what bothers me is that honorable members opposite, they see things that are not there, and they hear things that are not there. They hear, I, I at no time, I reject any suggestion or insinuation or statement coming from the honorable member for, for Karani is that in this place or any other place that I said Central. the members of the Valuations Tribunal, other than the chairman, shall be appointed presidentially in the discretion of the president. I did not say that. You cannot find that on any Hansard record in this place or in any other place. It does not exist. So therefore, what we have here is exactly the same as the Tax Appeal Board with an improvement because it limits the numbers to five where the Tax Appeal Board can be unlimited members appointed by the cabinet. This is clearly in the public interest. I beg to move, well Mr. Done. Deputy Speaker. Members, the minister has begged to move. According to procedure, I'm moving ahead. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 15 of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Clause 18A. <clears throat> Insert after Clause 18 the following new clause. Section 34A inserted. 18A. Members, one sec, one sec. Members, please, let's respect the procedural clerk also. Please, proceed. Procedural clerk. Insert after Clause 18 the following new clause. Section 34A inserted. 18A. The Act is amended by inserting after Section 34 the following new section. Confidentiality. 34A1. The Commissioner or any person duly authorized by him to receive information under this Act shall keep the information confidential and shall not share the information unless authorized under this Act or any other written law. 2. 
A person who contravenes subsection 1 commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $50,000. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that um, the Senate amendments to clause 18A. That, sorry, I beg to move that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to clause 18A of the Evaluation of Land Amendment Bill. And this was something proposed by one of the Senators in the other place, that we should have a, an offense created for breach of confidentiality because this is such a sensitive area in terms of personal, personal information. So that what this does, it introduces a clause whereby if there's a breach of confidentiality, the person who commits that and discloses person's personal information would be subject to a fine of $50,000 and summary conviction. And if you'll allow me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I was so distracted by the, <laughs> the, by the I don't know what to say, the by, the, by the fulminations and falsehoods and fabrications that I didn't answer a question put to me by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, who, who understands everything, by the way, which is a bit embarrassing for her members because the honourable member, and well, it's a fact, the honourable leader of opposition understands everything, whereas some of her members do not. And you leaving them to, to misrepresent. And, and it's unfortunate because the honourable member of the opposition understands clearly, in fact, was able to point out a little exactly. intricate detail to me yes. that, that made it crystallise the point that the, her members couldn't see. And Shocking and shameful, but anyway, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me go back to this whole point. It's <laughs> all right. It's not a mama guy. So there, there, are some, there are some stories in the newspapers, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There was, art, there was an article in the newspaper over the weekend that really was a little unprofessional. It was based on postings on social media on Facebook by anonymous posters, and it took these postings as fact and found their way into news, which apparently is the trend nowadays, that postings on social media are then reported in the mainstream media as fact. It's an unfortunate development of social media, but yes, people will just go on social media, some anonymous profile, some Mr. Speaker, profile. 48 one, what does that do with the confidentiality I'm clause? The, I'm, the I'm answering the question. I'm answering the question. Yeah. Remember? Okay. Thank you. But again, tighten quickly. I'm wrapping up now. Tighten quickly. I'm wrapping up now. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is pertinent and germane to the question. Because the, the, the things in the, in the media were about people trying to access personal information from property owners. And this amendment deals with a breach of confidentiality where you would disclose someone within the valuation system would disclose personal information. And we now are creating an offense for the disclosure of personal information and making a fine of $50,000. So what I am talking about is completely relevant. So there was a story in the papers about valuations commencing, persons calling up people, want to come to their home, want to inspect their properties and get personal information from them, which is now, if you disclose it, will be an offense. And I'm, I, I, I can simply say that it was very disappointing that that story was based on postings on Facebook mm -hmm. from anonymous posters, fake profiles. The story was completely inaccurate and wrong. We are using the existing law in as much as we can. There was a court decision with respect to the existing law which permitted the valuation division to do certain things within the ambit of the law. And if and when these Senate amendments are approved by this Honorable House, then we'll be able to do more than we are doing at this point in time. But at this point in time, we are acting completely within the ambit of the existing law, just to reassure Honorable Opposition Leader. Thank you. I beg to move, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Honorable Members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 18A of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. Contribution. Kearney Central. Please, members, let's... We do need the, close by close. So, and, again, once I pause, let's proceed, please. And the, Kearney Central. And the contribution is very simple. We appreciate the 
clause of confidentiality because it's important when the state creates its institutions that the, this matter of confidentiality is strictly adhered to. And therefore, these particular amendments are reasonable and we have no reason to quarrel with these amendments. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to Clause 18A of the Valuation of Land Amendment Bill 2018. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I understand from a statement I made across the floor by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition that there is no agreement that we can do all of the amendments together. So I'd like to get that matter just for the record. Um, Chief Whip, yes. in agreement that we take all the clauses together, yes. Leader of the House. So proceed, Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just give me one second. Okay. In the amendments before the House, in the first amendment, sorry, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I beg to move the following motion standing in my name to be resolved that the Senate amendments to the Property Tax Amendment Bill 2018, listed in Appendix 2, be now considered. The question is that the Senate amendments to the Property Tax Amendment Bill 2018, listed in Appendix 2 to the order paper, be now considered. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Um, Leader of the House and Chief Whip, in terms of reading the clause, would we need to enter it into the, the records? Okay, right, so amended as circulated, right. Three, six, eight, nine, ten, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. 10, 16, 18, 20, 21, 23, 24, 25. New clause 3A inserted. New clause 22A inserted. New clause 23A inserted. New clause 24A inserted. As appears in Appendix 2 of the other people. Minister of Finance. Indian, you know, I waited for the to speak at the call. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that this House agree with all of the amendments the clerk just read out of the Property Tax Amendment Bill 2018. And let me just deal with the first one. The first one is just grammatical. We are correcting, we are removing um, the word an. It shouldn't be there and the word capital value shouldn't be there. So that clause three, it, we're simply making some grammatical corrections. Clause six, again, typographical in nature, we, we're changing of to buy, and we're changing land op belonging to the state in occupation by as opposed to in occupation of. And in the List of amendments to, para, to um, the list of state, we are listing the state enterprises as this removes any subjectivity with, request, with respect to interpretation. 
So rather than having all of the um, state enterprise within the body, we are putting it in a schedule. And the, if, if one goes to the schedule, one will see that lands associated with the University of the Southern Caribbean are now included in the list of exempted universities. And this was requested by members of both the opposition and the Senate. We have the University of the West Indies being exempt from property tax, the University of Trinidad and Tobago being exempt from property tax. So you know, this, by this amendment to Clause 6, the University of the Southern Caribbean will be included in the list of exempted universities. And the reason is the government of Trinidad and Tobago over the years has contributed to physical development at the University of the Southern Caribbean. So we felt the government contributes to the University of the West Indies in terms of development of its property. It contributes to the University of Trinidad and Tobago in terms of its property. And it has contributed considerable sums of money to the development of this University of the Southern Caribbean in terms of its property. So we just thought it was only appropriate that um, we include the University of the Southern Caribbean as an exempt entity in terms of property tax. With respect to Clause 8, again, this is just typographical, where we are just cleaning up um, the words the new and calling them a new. So we're changing the word the to a. In terms of Clause 9, we are asking for a more reasonable time in terms of refunds by the Board of Indian Revenue to citizens. So we are changing the time frame, which was currently 60 days for a refund to 30 days. So we are shortening the time by which the Board of Indian Revenue, if someone has overpaid for property tax, if, if one looks at um, Clause 9, it says in paragraph A, in the proposed new subsection 1A, delete the word 60 and substitute the word 30. And if I go to the actual bill itself, which should be, all members should have a copy of the bill. If I go to clause nine of the bill, of the amendment bill, the amendment to the property tax act amendment bill, if you look at nine A, one A, A, it speaks as follows. An overpayment of tax due the board shall, within 60 days of the date of the new notice, refund the amount of such overpayment. So, where as an assessment of an amendment to the assessment rule there has been an overpayment, the board shall, within 60 days, refund the amount of such overpayment. So, we've shortened that to 30 days. We've harmonized it with if there's an underpayment. So, if you go to the next one, 91AB, you see where, as a result of an amendment to the assessment, there has been an underpayment the additional tax shall become due and payable within 30 days. So we felt if there's an overpayment, the Board of Indian Revenue will refund the person within 30 days, and if it's an underpayment, they'll be required to pay within 30 days. So we're just harmonizing the two. In terms of clause 10, well, after the 30 days, the interest, interest becomes due and payable. Okay, so it's whether it's paid or not, the government has a liability. The interest starts to kick, kick in after 30 days on both counts. If there's an underpayment or an overpayment. Yeah, okay. <laughs> in clause 10, <laughs> in clause 10, we're simply taking out the word A and substituting the word the. So it's just a grammatical, typographical correction. In, in terms of um, clause 16, we are mending... Section 31 of the Parent Act, and we changed, we changed the word collected to received. And it, the reason why we're changing the word collected to received, we had quite a discussion on this in the other place. This has to do with a tenant who is paying the um, tax on behalf of the owner. And we felt that you shouldn't want to burden a tenant with the responsibility to collect a tax. So 
we change collect to received so that it, it shifts the burden of paying the tax. It avoids shifting the burden of paying the tax to the tenant as it is not the tenant's responsibility. What was there before was an ambiguous situation where the Board of Inland Revenue might try to collect property tax from a tenant, which we thought was unfair. It is whether, if they receive it from the tenant, it is then deducted from the tax paid, payable by the owner. So the owner is required to pay. The tenant can pay on the owner's behalf, but you can't go behind the tenant to pay for the tax. So we change it from collect to receive. So the, it's now, if you receive tax from a tenant, then it goes on the record, but you can't go and collect tax from a tenant. So that is the change to 16. With respect to 18, This deals with a grace period. It changes the date on which penalties and interest begin to accrue. And it was felt that a grace period of six months is more reasonable than a grace period of 12 months. That was the consensus of the Senate. With respect to clause 20, Again, talk grammatical. Just putting in, taking out the word and before the word three months. 21 is the power to distrain. This was an error. There's no such person, apparently, as um, a district revenue. There's a district revenue officer. So you have, to, you have to put in the word officer. Officer was left out in clause 21. So you put after the word revenue, the word officer. So, in other words, you had control of accounts and other persons, but they had district revenue. So, just a typographical error. In terms of Clause 23, this was a hot topic, both here and in and the other place, where we had, in this place, we had amended the waiver of property tax from December 2015 to December 2016. And there was a lot of heat about this both here, outside, and in the other place. So we made a policy statement, and I'm reiterating it here today for the avoidance of any doubt. The tax will only be collected in the year when the administrative arrangements are in place. So the 50% of valuations, for example, when that kicks in, when 50% of properties are valued, and the Commission of Valuations informs the minister that then, in that year, then the tax is due and payable. So whether it is this year or whether it is next year, no, 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 we, <laughs> we are not that slow. <laughs> so that the tax, would, the tax would be collected in the year that the administrative arrangements are in place. So that is why we have changed it to 2017. We've changed 2016 to 2017. So the tax is no longer due for 2017 because the administrative arrangements were not in place in 2017. We expect to have them ready in 2018. 2018 has some months to go still, you know. So <laughs> we have a lot of we have a lot of months to go. <laughs> in, uh, clause 24. Oh sure, yeah. So I think you are saying, Minister, that there will, if you establish in 2018, there will be no retroactivity to 2017. That is quite okay. correct. Absolutely. And so, so to in 19. And yes, and, and so we go along. So if we need. We will amend it from 17 to 18, as the case may be, as we go along. Clause 24, and we expect, as I, I Mr. Deputy Speaker, through you, we expect to be able to complete administrative arrangements in this year, 2018, so that the tax could be collected in this year. If we do not achieve that, then we'll do it next year. So 24. This matter, this issue of the retroactivity was cause for concern by many persons. Now we have with us your amendment, um, changing 2016 to 2070. Yeah. Would you be kind enough to read how that reads into the Parent Act? Sure. What is this is going to kick in 2017? I know you're saying, or such later date as the Minister may advise. In other words, it's a Parent Act that we need to read your new words into. Certainly. Uh, to get peace, thank you. Certainly. I could just, let's start first with the amendment bill which should give the picture. 
Section 52A of the Act is amended. This is the current amendment bill. Section 52A of the Act, 52A of the Act, is amended by deleting the words 31st December 2015, which is the current cutoff date after which the tax becomes due and payable, and substituting the words 30 September 2016. That's the amendment bill. By this amendment, we change the the date 30 September 2016 to 30 September 2017. So that means that the tax is no longer due up to the 30th of the sorry 30 September. 2017. And then, uh, this was a proposal made by independent senators that rather than having to come back to Parliament every year and keep changing it 17, 18, 19, the minister could, by order, just say 18, 19, and so on. That's, what, that's the effect of it. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, we just have the amendment bill plus the further amendment today. I'm asking perhaps if we could get a copy of the parent. The parent. So this is something to insert into the section. 52 of the existing 52A. parent law. Perhaps yeah. uh, we can ask someone to get it. You have 50 parents. You have the if parent. Have, yeah. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you just give me a second, I'll see if I can pull it up now. Um, um, the parent. Minister, you can continue. Uh, uh, someone has got a copy, so I'll take a look at it. Okay, we have it here. Okay. This is the parent. 52 years at present, notwithstanding any written law to the contrary. The payment of any tax under this Act shall be waived for the period 1st January 2010 to 31st de December 2015. That was before this amendment bill. And now it will, and with the amendment bill, it would have read, notwithstanding any written law to the contrary, the payment of any tax under this Act shall be waived for the period 1st January 2010 to 31st December 2016. And that now goes to. 30 September 2017, or such later date as the minister may by order prescribe. It means there's no retroactivity. Okay? So I just want to make that clear. There shall be no retroactivity. Okay? Uh, we'll come back to it. I just want to be sure that that would have been... It is not that it would be 27 and continue. Could, you, could you stand, language. please, member? I'm sorry. Just in the language, in. I felt you were within committee. I'm sorry. I'll keep looking at it and... Um, I'll ask again if I need to. No, what, what, what the amendment made by the previous government, your government, what the effect of that was that any tax due from January 2010 to December 2015 was waived. The effect of this amendment means that any tax due from January 2010 to September, January 2010, the effect of this amendment, when you read everything together, any tax due from January 2010 to September 2017 is waived. And then the minister can move that 2017 to 2018 and 2019 by order. Okay, so there's no retroactivity. Yes, that is right. Yeah, right. Just let me get back my notes now. I don't know where my notes are. to Parliament to keep changing the date, we would, the Minister would just extend by order. So let's move on now. Hold on a second, please. I've lost my place. Yeah, just now. I have, I have speaking notes. I just have to get them. Property tax. Right. So 24... This is this now ch giving again, um, honourable members opposite, what we're doing in 24 is that instead of as passed in the House, where the Minister may by order amend the schedules, we're now changing this to the Minister will have to come to Parliament to uh, amend the schedules by affirmative resolution. And that's a big move. And that, those schedules are the rates of tax. So if the minister wants to change the rate of tax, change the residential rate from 3% to 2% or 4% as the case may be, the minister must come to parliament and get the approval of parliament to do this. So this is a significant change that we have made to the legislation. Now, 25. 
we were just adding an honorable leader of the opposition. I, I realize you're occupied, but I thought there was something here that you may wish to know with respect to the amendment to 25. The leader in the other place, opposition person in the other place, felt that we should not amend the schedule of exempt institutions except by affirmative resolution and debate in parliament. And then the honorable senator saw that we were um, putting in Shogunas Bagong Corporation as an exempt institution. So I asked him if he want me to take that back out and have it debated in both houses. Well, that killed the old talk one time. <laughs> so we brought in Shogunas Borough Corporation and we added in law association too. I asked one of the lawyers present when they wanted us to debate that by affirmative resolution, whether the law association should be uh, exempt from property tax. Well, again, talk done. <laughs> all right, so all we're doing is we're including as exempt um, entity Shogunas Borough Corporation, which is somehow left out, and law association of Trinidad and Tobago. And then we're now inserting a new clause 3A, which um, the effect of the new clause 3A, let me go back to the top now. The new clause 3A allows a proper assessment of buildings that are of mixed use or multi-dwelling buildings or commercial plus residential and so on. It allows the commissioner valuations to value each element in a building as a distinct element. So if you have a residential portion of a, a piece of, of, of a building, it will be valued for residential purposes. If it's commercials, because you have buildings which are residential and commercial, and therefore the tax would, of 3% would apply to the residential component and 5% would, would, would um, apply to the commercial component. So what this does is gives the commissioner valuations now to the ability to distinguish between parts of a building that are used for different purposes in terms of applying the taxation. The new clause 22A is just cleaning up the language uh, new clause 23A, again, there was nothing in the bill, there was nothing in the, in the amendment bill that allowed regulations to be subject to any form of parliamentary oversight. So we've now put in that regulation shall be subject to negative resolution of parliament. So the parliament will see the regulations made by the minister under the act and can negative them move a motion to negative them or debate them as they see fit. And um, 24A is just tidying up language. So those are the explanations for all of the amendments to the Property Tax Act, and I beg to move, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendment to the Property Tax Amendment Bill 2018, appearing in Appendix 2 in the other paper. All in favor? Um, That's all in favor. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, we have had the benefit of the explanation of the minister, and um, during the course of his presentation, there was a healthy exchange as well, so that a few matters that were, I was in, we were intending to raise have been um, discarded with. But just a few small issues on clarification. And um, I can jump from three, six, eight, nine, and so on, and, and go. Um, just to the minister, while, of course, we understand thoroughly the attempt to bring some relief to persons who um, under, I'm looking at clause 20. Yeah, we're looking at clause 20 already. Um, persons who, you have changed the timing, I believe. Is it clause 20? No, no, it's clause 9. Clause 9. Where you have moved from the 60 to the 30 days. 
to refund, refund and so on. The, the, the issue there is while this may appear good on paper, and I mean it's something that we, everybody would feel like nice looking at, that there's some commitment and there's some you know, understanding that this can happen in practice because that time you know, appears to be so short. And given the normal run of the mill of persons, I remember during your presentation when a member on our side indicated, why don't you do that for VAT refund as well? There was a collective giggle. And it suggests that while it is an attempt to, yeah, while there was an attempt to appease someone, that you will have a more reasonable and humane approach to meeting and treating with overpayment of tax and underpayment of tax. One really questions whether at all something like that is feasible in that limited time that you have given yourself. But, uh, Minister, just to go back to what you yourself describe as a hot topic and a topic that has really created a lot of stir, um, not only on the social media, but in the mainstream media as well, of this date. And there's an attempt to bring some type of clarity to it by stating that you have deleted 2016 and substitute 2017. But you went on to say, delete after the word 2017 and B, the words or such later date as the minister may by order prescribe on the understanding that there may well be um, another situation where the dates have to change, the goalposts need to change because of the implementation uh, timetable. But uh, you may want to still clarify uh, whether or not you know, this is needed in the first place because to, to someone reading it, it still appears that 2017 is the border is the border for the payment of taxes, assuming that it is implemented. So, hypothetically, if all your arrangements are in place by September or November this year, does it mean that persons for uh, commercial, residential, and so on, persons will be asked to pay that tax dating back to September 2017? Because the, you said that as soon as the arrangements in place that the commissioner by writing indicate to you that 50% or more have been um, valued, you will move immediately to implementation. And as it is now, the bill says clearly that the backward date border is 2017 September. So it stands to reason that that is the date upon which they will. Now, again, I ask for clarity. And I know when I ask for clarity, I get insults. In 1983, I learned that when you don't have an argument, you insult. Member, member. Yes. <coughs> Please. Yeah. yeah. Let's, 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 let's Thank you. Proceed. So we ask for clarity, uh, knowing that what we will get. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, just go to 25, close 25 now. And while I understand the, uh, the reasoning for introducing the Shagwana's Borough Corporation and the Law Association, I think they may have had a, a lobby somewhere. Just to remind the minister that in the schedule we, for exemption, this schedule actually includes the Board of Engineering, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board, the Firearms Appeal Board, the Land Survey Board, and so on. And I was wondering whether the minister will also consider placing in that arm the properties and property owned by the trade union movement, by trade unions. And uh, I know it came up, but... It didn't stay up. So just as you have included the Blind Welfare Society, the RFIAMs, and all these organizations, I think the minister should consider as well the trade union uh, movement for exemption. Another matter that came up but did not stay up was the issue of pensioners and to what extent pensioners may get relief and could be included as an, an area for exemptions. And the minister may... I think the minister made a commitment somewhere. The minister made a commitment that he will review the situation for pensioners to see what assistance pensioners can get by way of exemptions of one kind or another. It may not be a complete exemption, but it may be some help that may be forthcoming. It's a commitment I think the minister I made elsewhere. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't want to rise on 48.1, but there's no amendment to that section dealing with relief for, for pensioners. No, I, I said you made a commitment elsewhere, not that there's an amendment. No, right, a member, um, yes. just for clarity, once you're going on to a particular clause, let's call the clause number, please. Sure. Right. 
Okay, I was on clause 25, and I now move on to section 3A inserted, the new um, area. And this is a, a new area, as it says here, the act is amended by inserting after section 3, the following new section, building or accommodation to be deemed land, and so on and so forth, and it is there. Um, this is new, so it is not something we can refer back to, um, but there's, need, there's still need for some measure of clarity as to the extent to which this can lead to some type of burden upon persons owning the single dwelling, multi-dwelling apartment buildings and so on, where it may be that someone who owns one of these apartments and so on pay their property tax, but the owner of the entire complex is also paid, and it may lead to some type of burden where someone is owning the apartment or flat or townhouse, as the case may be, they're already paying to the owner maintenance fees, taxes, contributing even to the property tax, or in the old days, land and building tax, but to the property tax. And then because of the wording of this and, and what is, it is seeking to do, they may face, a, for want of a better term, a double taxation. They may face a double blow by having to pay the, the building owner certain taxes and certain fees, and then having to pay to the government um, a property tax as described here. So that, that is something that could be clarified, I think, easily, and could be stated categorically for the record that that is not um, so. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, at the new clause 23A inserted, uh, while I did understand for the area of the amendment to the schedule, the need for well, the need to amend the schedule without necessarily affirmative resolution and so on. Um, I'm wondering whether at section 53 as amended, and this is the new clause 23A I'm looking to on page 17, whether or not the minister will consent to change the regulations made under, under this section shall be subject to affirmative resolution of parliament rather than negative resolution of parliament, given the importance of these measures and given the public disquiet and the, the hot topic issues and the entire bill is, is, is hot topic, uh, given the nature of this, whether the minister will, will look at affirmative resolution in the parliament. Um, yes, because it will also bring more transparency and clarity if critical areas of the bill and the act require affirmative resolution, at least for debate. The government will always have their number and their majority and so on, but at least it will bring clarity and present an opportunity to discuss uh, various issues. So I'm not speaking specifically about amending the schedule because that will not have a big purpose, but of the other regulations that the minister may be making pursuant to this, um, uh, this piece of legislation. Thank you. Member for Kearney Central. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Since the, since the Minister of Finance raised the issue of the um, percentage at which taxes are triggered in terms of administrative achievement, that's to say 50%, I do want to raise an issue that I raised earlier, and I suspect that it will now be uh, relevant, Germain, that 25% of the people who own property are squatters, <laughs> which is about 75,000 of a 450,000 um, household ownership in the country. And that 50% do not have their property arrangements legalized so that of the remainder, when you take 75,000 from 450, if you take 50%, what it means is that 158,000 households in this country are going to be carrying the burden of taxes. I want the minister to tell me whether I am wrong or whether I'm correct and whether this is meant to be the situation or whether over time this will be rectified. The second thing is that since you are going for a target of 50%, 
how many are actually um, valued at this time? How many have gone through the process where you can say, well, okay, we can proceed to address tax taxation for those households? And I think that that would be an important issue to indicate whether you are correct that you might be in a position to begin to collect taxes in 2018, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In relation to that, the households, I want to say that, you know, we are probably the only country, unlike, let's say, Jamaica, which calculates its taxes on the basis of an assessment of current market value. We are the only people who deal with the site, who deal with improvements and tax people on those improvements, and who deal with the um, rental value in order to determine the taxation um, amount for the property. And I wonder in the context of legislation that is fair and reasonable and not prone to arbitrariness whether this in fact is a good thing. The second issue I want to deal with is the issue of retroactivity. The minister cleared that up very well and if he gives us that assurance and the amendment allows the minister in fact to ensure that taxes do not include any manner of retroactivity but begins in the year when the application of the tax law begins, then we want to hold him to that assurance and we would not like any confusion to emerge during the course of this year or next year on that particular matter. The, the, I, many of the amendments here are very straightforward and I do not wish to address those, but I do want to, since at the 24A we talk about residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural, I don't want to get into all of them and I've raised the issue of the residential in relation to the targets, in relation to the ret no retroactivity, and we are now have now by amendment here introduced uh, um, properties. We've made, we've discriminated uh, in terms of determination of taxation of prop property, for instance, between commercial and residential, residential, commercial, etc. But one of the elements here is industrial. Um, property tax. And I want to ask a few questions about that. I, I don't think that the industrial... Mr. Yes. Deputy Speaker, again, 48-1, I'm kind of losing track. What, which one of the clauses are you talking about? Actually, remember, one sec, one second. Actually, I was now going to rise in order to make the same point. Identify the particular clause so that we'll be clear in terms of going forward, please, because in terms of the amendment? Yeah, in, in 24A, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the new clause is inserted, schedule one of the act is amended by inserting the word residential, the, after the word residential, the word land, by inserting after the word commercial, the word land, after in, inserting after the word industrial, the word land, and by inserting the word agricultural, the after the word agricultural land. So I was going to raise some issues, having raised some about households and what you might call property tax for individual homeowners, I wanted to raise some issues about industrial uh, properties. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll have to cite 48.1 because that's just a typographical amendment, just to include the word land, that's all. It has nothing to do with the substance of the, the content. It's just a um, typographical amendment. Right. Uh, member, um, how detailed you plan to be on it? Um, well, I, I would just, like to give you the opportunity, yes. but again, 
you know, tighten and just bring it closer because as the Minister of Finance yes, says, it's just changes. But, yes. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you would give me the liberty, I will raise four points on the industrial property. Four points? Yes. And I will be very short very and brief. elaborate. Very what brief. clause would that be? We're just adding the word land after the word commercial. It, it doesn't affect the content. It's a grammatical change. Now, again, remember, according to the procedures, we're not supposed to go into any debate. It's just the amendment coming out of the Senate, and it's a word amendment. So I'll give you one point. No, Bring in your main point. Bring in your main point, um, member. I, I understand you, Mr. Deputy. Because I am guided by procedures also. Yes, right? okay. Fair I, enough, I, right? I understand, so, yeah, sir. But, yeah. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't, I don't mean to be problematic at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised that the minister would object to my making a couple of points on commercial property. When they are included, look 24A here, I see the word residential, quote unquote, I see the word commercial, quote unquote. He didn't make any com objection when I talked about residential, commercial, which he mentioned. Why would he make an objection in industrial? And the reason he is making that objection, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is because the industrial part of this property tax, these property tax amendments remain very uncertain. Speaker 48.1, all this is doing is adding the word land after the word residential, commercial, and industrial. That's all. We could have left it as is. It was simply a request coming from a senator in the other place. Nothing to do with the content. Just add the word land after the word industrial. That's all. Member, member, I already ruled one point. Proceed. Right, I'm giving you the opportunity for one point. If it is that you one point, I'll, I'll make the one point. Right, one main point. Yeah. All right, and because the one because point I am guided by procedure also. The one point I I am grateful, Deputy Speaker, for your allowing me the one point, and I would be very succinct. I would ask, like to ask the question on industrial property, I, or make the point that the criteria for the evaluation of industrial property tax is not clear and it is not precise. There is a great deal of uncertainty about the valuation process and those can run into thousands of dollars in terms of industrial property. And that has implications for the climate of investment. It has implications. Deputy Speaker, we are simply amending Schedule 1 of the Property Tax Act, which has type of property, residential, commercial, res industrial. And we're simply saying type of property, residential land, type of property, commercial land, type of property, industrial land. We are just adding the word land. That's all the amendment is doing. But I think your point has been made, yes. right, in terms of what you're trying to portray what and it is, yes. accept it. Thank you very um, much. I will, I will stay away from it. You have another I, clause? No, I will. I, I, I have, I'm finished with that now, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I will just close by saying that these are, we must remember that these amendments are amendments to an amendment bill that came here which amended the parent bill. And the question is... The parent bill was established in 2009. The amendment bill was 2018, and we are now making amendments to that. The critical issue is whether these amendments really and truly and comprehensively rationalizes the property tax regime in Trinidad and Tobago in a meaningful and fair way that is not prone to arbitrariness. And I would say that these amendments here do not, in my view, add anything if those are the objectives of the tax bill in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker.
a new clause has been inserted, um, a, a new section for the bill, section 3A. I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at uh, page 16 of the amendments. Thank you. Now, I have a, a question for you, Honorable Minister. Based on the definitions given in the parent law as to what will constitute the asset to be taxed, and this is where what you just did about, say, residential land, commercial land, you change your schedule because it reverts back to the definition of land in the parent law. And, um, Honorable Deputy Speaker, uh, this is relevant to the new three, e but I have to tie them together. Um, so land means, in the definition section of the Property Tax Act, A, all land, etc., B, land covered with water, and all buildings or any part of a building. So the building already becomes land, so we're taxing land. But then today, we are being asked to approve a section 3A. And it says, 3A, inserted, sorry, inserted, 3 capital E, part A of that, where a building occupies separately from other buildings a location on a single parcel of land, the building shall, for the purposes of liability to tax under this act, be deemed to be land. My question is this. If you have a dog kennel, a dog, uh, what you call it? Uh, a dog house on your premises, if you have a duck pond, as I do, if you have a, uh, no, no, the duck pond, the fall cup, a fall cup, a cup, a tool shed. Uh -huh. And for those who have swimming pools, I don't have one. Um, if you have like a little cabana, change, change place and so on, is each of those, will each of those items be taxed? Will each one be based on this 3A now? That each bill, or do I then have to go and try and take a piece of governors and join up? A person has his foul pen or dog, dog kennel and so on. How will those be treated? Yeah, please, I'm asking a question. Yeah, I'm asking you to kindly clarify that. And further, based on an amendment made earlier today, um, it is clear that the minimum or the ceiling of 18,500 that was inserted in earlier in the session, 18,500, 18,000. 18, 18, I can't read my own handwriting. 18,000. That was an amendment earlier today, and which says that anyone, any piece of property, any piece of land as, as defined in, in the law, that you will have to pay a minimum of $540. That's what it will work out to. So if you have this dog house, whatever, the things I just mentioned, dog house might be worth $100, but you will, is, if it's classified in this way separately, do you then have to pay $540, the minimum amount of money? So do we pay for those, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That's all I want to say on this. Yes, sir. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. Let, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank honorable members opposite for their contributions, except perhaps sometimes enthusiasm gets in the way of the standing orders. Because the standing orders are clear. When we are discussing amendments, we discuss the amendments only and not the parent act, even though you might want to do that. You can't. You shouldn't. No, no, I'm talking to the member of Kearney Central who has a tendency, whenever we are dis uh, debating amendments, to debate everything under the sun as a kind of a opportunity. Yes, but yeah, that's all right. It's not relevant. So let me deal with 3A now. Let me deal with 3A. Yes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is not relevant to the debate on these amendments. Of course, but not relevant to what we're doing today. So let me deal with 3A. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't know why the member for Carney Central is just muttering and mumbling. Could you? Members, uh, on Finance Minister, just the chair. All right, I will ensure that, that things are taken care of. Proceed. Let me deal with, in reverse order, with the question raised by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. This is intended to identify a building. 
that is separate from another building. So, but when you get your valuation, is evaluation of your property. So you'd have a piece of land on which there are separate buildings. So you'd be liable to pay tax on the entire property, but each building would be valued separately. It's not that each building would attract a value of $18,000, whether it's a small structure as you've described. It's the entire um, property contained within the boundaries of the piece of land. No, it wouldn't be valued at, Mr. Deputy Speaker, through you. The various little buildings will not each be valued at $18,000. The yes, they are, they are, yeah, the total, the total. So it's not that you have a foul coop here, a duck pond there, a dog kennel there, a cabana there, a gazebo over so, and each one will be 18000 No. It is that each, the value of each one, will be determined separately. And then when you add it all together, if it is less than 18000 it will be set at $18,000. OK? So it's not that each one will attract a value of 18000 It's the value of all the buildings on the land will be added up. And if they are less than eighteen, it will go to eighteen. OK? Is that, does that clarify the issue? I could ask. In, in valuing the premises, we will be valuing the dog house or the duck pond or the collective and then you'll get a cumulative total from each item that is valued. So those matters are going to be valued. So Minister, please, I'm just trying to understand it. Because most many people do have a dog kennel or a little fowl, fowl pen or duck pen as the case may be. People try and cow sheds and so on, goat goat pen. Temples, some people have their temples in, in, in their yards and so on. So even if the val the, 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 this, this, I'm speaking now for those most vulnerable, even if it is that a person has a building that is really worth a few hundred dollars, so you have ply board, in some cases is a um, straw roof, or you call it thatch roof, carrot, yeah, carrot. I remember I used to live in a place like that once. Carrot um, roof, um, ply board or galvanized as the case may be, and then the little dog house, and all of that comes up maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars, yes. But I will be valued at a minimum of eighteen thousand. That just gives me a little concern. Um, I cannot speak to that. I should not be because that was the amendment to the valuation that you made. You have a ceiling. Everybody, regardless of what it is that is on your property, you are going to be valued as eighteen thousand five hundred. So just a concern. You've cleared it. I will have to pay tax for the dog house. That's basically what it is. No, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will answer the question posed by the Leader of the Opposition. I notice other members don't seem to understand, on her side, don't seem to understand what we're talking about. Because they're muttering all sorts of contradictory things and introducing mischief as the Honorable Leader of the Opposition is speaking. Let me clarify. You have raw land, which has a value, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And on this raw land, you would have structures. So the value of the property is the value of the raw land plus the value of the structures. So even the example given by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, even though these items may not have significant value, they may be valued at $5,000, $10,000 as the case may be. And you'll be surprised, I think you should talk to the member for Tabakit at how much even one of those little structures now costs to construct. You'll be surprised. It, you'll be really surprised because this works out at $40 a month. This is what it is, $40 a month. So that it's the value of the raw land, but it's the value of all the structures on the land. When that valuation is done, the land, raw, plus the structures, it comes up to less than $18,000, and $18,000 valuation is placed on it, making the minimum property tax liable to be four. Well, I, you, have to, you have to take out 10% for voids. So it's 480. So it's about $42, four, $480 approximately when you take out the 10% for voids. So it's about $42, $43 a month. And if someone is unable to pay that $42, then the other section of the, the law kicks in where because of your financial situation, you are unable to pay the tax, you apply for a waiver. So if someone is unable to pay that $40, they can apply on the basis of hardship to be exempted from the tax. So 
The purpose of this amendment is simply to say you have a piece of raw land because the building can't exist in space. So the property is both the value, the, the, the assessed value is both the value of the raw land plus the structures on it, whether they be shacks or, or um, the examples that you have given. And as I said, once you value the raw land and you value the structures and you come up to less than 18, it's set at 18, which results in a tax of $40 a month. And if you can't pay $40 a month, you apply for relief to the, the, the valuation tribunal. Sure. Thank you. Um, in other words, every structure, whether dog house, dog pond, or whatever, all are going to be put in the cumulative, cumulative value. Um, another scenario, Minister, um, if you can explain, is where the land, you have the land, a piece of land, there is no structure. You have no commercial activity on it. It's just a piece of land. You mentioned raw land before. Yeah. Uh, so it's not commercial. You are not planting on it, so it's not agricultural. In other words, there's land sitting there. How would we classify that into the three categories you've given us? Commercial, industrial, and what's the other one? Uh, residential. residential. How would it be? Sure. Please. The classification is based on the zoning. So if you have a piece of land that is approved for agriculture and the classification has not changed, it would attract the tax of 1% for agriculture. If you have sought a change of use and you have received a change of use and the building is now zoned for commercial by town country planning, then the raw land will attract the commercial value of that particular raw land. If you apply again for change of use, if, let, let's start with the least common denominator, agricultural land. If, if a piece of land is approved by town country planning and zoned as agriculture, it will attract 1% of its rental value, which in most cases of agricultural land, maybe $100 or something like that. It will be minimal. The tax on agricultural land is the rental value at 1% is very small, $100, $80. If someone has a large piece of agricultural land, and they want to convert it to housing, they would apply to town country planning. And if they receive of change of use, now that piece of land will be zoned for residential um, purposes. And now will attract a different value if you chose to sell it now with the approvals that you have received, converting from agriculture to residential. Of course, it will have a different value and will now attract 3% of whatever that residential value is. If you had a piece of residential land now, Let's keep going up the scale. And you want to convert it to commercial land. Or the other it's, way around. Or the other way around. Yes, you go the other way. But if you let's, let's go up. Residential land, you want to convert it to commercial. You apply to town country planning. You go through the process. You get approval now to change the use of that land from residential to commercial. Again, it will attract a higher value, the land, the raw land, and have a higher percentage applied to it, and industrial as the case may be. So that is how the tax would be applied to raw land. It's based on its approved use by the Town and Country Planning Division. Okay? Sure. Thank you very much. So what happens where it's a squatter? I think some of our speakers before raised the issue of squatters, where they do not have any title. I mean, does it mean that whatever that land was zoned, was classified as at some point in time way back when? How, what tells me, if I hold title, maybe that will tell me I am, my, my land is on agriculture, or my land is what you've just said, residential and so on. What about those without title? What determines the zoning? What determines that zoning? Town and country, is it town and country then that says, and therefore that every parcel of land in Trinidad and Tobago is at present classified as some either residential, commercial, or, and, and, and the second question is, you mentioned um, when the value shares about 50%, the whole thing will kick in and you'll be able to collect your taxes. Um, do you have any idea of how many properties are valued thus far? You have to reach 50%. So how many are to be valued? How many have already been done? And then we have an idea of how much is outstanding of your target of 50%. So please, um, two sets of questions, Honorable Minister. Firstly, Dealing with your earlier question, I just want to point out in the amendment bill, we had a very similar um, clause. Eh? In other words, what you are seeing here in 3A, it's not brand new. It, although it's a new clause, it's not brand new. Because in clause 3 of the original act, we had 
where a building occupies separately from other buildings or location on a single parcel of land, the building shall, for the purposes of liability tax, under this act, begin to be land. So that was already there. All we did was separate it in the definition section. It was one of the senators in the other place who said, look, I don't think that should be in the general interpretation section. Let's create a new section and put it all on its own. And that is why we have a new clause 3A, because we've hived that off from what was already there, already passed in this place. With respect to the number of properties, I'm sorry, I don't want to talk out of turn. Um, I would certainly um, be prepared to answer those questions. I do not wish to talk out of turn today and give, and give information on how many properties have been valued, how many are being valued, how many will be valued. I'd prefer not to answer that at this point in time, but I undertake to answer it as soon as possible in the future. So let me go back now to... Um, Minister of Finance, member for Kearney East is trying to get... Oh, sure, sure. Sure, sure. Sure, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Honorable Minister, could you give some elucidation or some clarity on the aspect of the industrial property in relation to the equipment or machinery, how you value that in terms of the overall, let's say a manufacturing company has a number of equipment, machinery, and so on on the entire plant. How you come about to do that evaluation? Because those are some of the questions that are being asked of us, and we can't give an answer to it. Uh, for instance, I'm in my medical practice, or anybody, and they have a, a, a large um, piece of equipment valued about $1 million. How, how do you value that? And give some clarity to it for us, please, if you can. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I myself do not, to, do not wish to run afoul of the standing orders. That is not an amendment before us. I am sure we can discuss it at another time. But that is not an amendment before us. How you value a piece of machinery does not appear on any of this list of amendments. I am sure, Honorable Member, we can come to some resolution. I understand it's important. I'm not trying to in any way downplay what you have said. It's a very important question. In fact, it has been raised with me by the TIA Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturers Association, and it is something we need to clarify. But it is not on the list of amendments. So unlike the member for Kearney Central, I do not wish to run afoul of Standing Order 48.1. <laughs> so let us go now. I, I know honorable members opposite have no problem with running afoul of 48.1 but I have a problem with breaching the standing orders, so I don't intend to breach them. So, <laughs> let's now go to... Um, Remember you and your wine in a prep? Yes, I am. Let's now, I'm, I'm just dealing with questions asked. I was asked a question about 25. Why not trade unions? We had some debate on this in the other place. But there are some trade unions, not all, that have investment property earning millions of dollars. Very wealthy ones. What do you have to say about that, Kuva, Honorable Member for Kuva South? I notice you're grinning. <laughs> there are some trade unions that have a lot of investment property, and we saw no reason why we should exempt trade unions. Why? Because then you should exempt the Chamber of Commerce, the Trinidad Tobago Chamber of Commerce, the Tunapuna Chamber of Commerce, the Penal Davy Chamber of Commerce. You should exempt them too if you're going to exempt trade unions who own investment properties earning income. So we didn't see it was fair unreasonable to just single them, take them out. With respect to common areas, this is an issue raised by the member for Oropooch East, and I want to reassure me, Oropooch East, that once the honorable member refers to matters that actually do exist and are written, you will get a very comprehensive response from myself. It is only when the honorable member refers to imaginary things that you are not going to get a response. Now, no, we are dealing with an issue here. It's a question raised on, on, what is it? New Clause 3A. And the question was raised on multiple owners in a building. And what would happen if the owner of the property taxes individual owners and then the government taxes? Well, in the first place, in, property owners can't tax anybody. It's only the government collects taxes. But 
There is no doubt that charges are levied for maintenance of common areas. The tax on common areas would either be paid by the owner of the property, because there are two ways a property developer can develop a multi-use building. He can retain ownership of the common areas for himself, and he can charge the other persons who own parts of the building a fee for the use of the common areas. That's one way. Or each property owner, each individual property owner, gets a share in a company which together owns. So if you have a building with, say, 50 apartments, each, prop each apartment owner will get one share out of 50, and they all own shares in the company, which would have a board of directors elected by the individual owners, and they will make decisions. So it's either or. Either the company, which would be owned by shares of all the individual owners, or the original owner would retain the common heirs, they would be liable for tax. So there's no way, unless there's a breach of the law, that an individual owner could be taxed twice. He only taxed once. And the other tax for the common areas goes to either the company or the original owner. So it is an area which could cause some confusion. But as we go along, we hope that landlords will be sensible and not try to tax people uh, in breach of the law. Yeah. With respect to the request that regulations be affirmative, well, I should let the honorable member know in the current law, is no oversight by parliament at all. It simply said in the Property Act, Tax Act of 2009, which to you, Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Member, when he was in government, never sought to change. There's no parliamentary oversight. So we thought, to, we thought to make a step and make it negative. So it's laid in parliament. When you have, by negative resolution, every member of parliament gets to see what the regulations are and can debate them. And basically, that is it, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think I've answered all the questions. I thank honorable members for their contributions, and I beg to move. Honorable members, the question is that this House agree with the Senate in the amendments to the Property Tax Amendment Bill 2018, appearing in Appendix 2 in the order paper. Those in favor say aye. aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that this house do now adjourn to a date to be fixed. Honorable members, before I put the question on the motion for the adjournment of the house, I am sure members are aware that we will be commemorating both Indian Arrival Day and the Feast of Corpus Christi on Wednesday, May 30th, 2018, and Thursday, May 31st, 2018, respectively. We will be doing Indian Arrival Day greetings at first. Honorable members, May 30th, 1845, marked the arrival of the Fatel Razak to Trinidad, bringing not only a source of labor for the estates, but a new people with a new culture, transforming the socio-cultural landscape of Trinidad and Tobago. I will now call upon members to expect to express greetings on the occasion of Indian Arrival Day. I will recognize the acting Prime Minister, Indian Arrival Day, sorry, Minister of Health, Member for St. Joseph. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Trinidad and Tobago has the distinction of possibly being the first country to recognize Arrival Day as a public holiday. In 1945, we would have celebrated the 100th anniversary 
of that day. And it was declared a public holiday in 1995 in commemoration of the 150th, 150th anniversary of this arrival. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when one looks up the meaning of the word arrival, you get words like dawn, a new beginning, a new way of thinking. An arrival that we celebrate today is not only the arrival of a people, but the arrival of one people with different ethnicities, cultures, and religions. Not only did Hindus arrive, but also Muslims arrive. Not only did Hindus and Muslims arrive, but some Christians also arrived. Some of the 143,959 persons that came between 1845 and 1979, did not, uh, 1917, did not only come from India directly. In tracing the Presbyterian roots on my wife's side of the family, it was discovered that some Indians actually went to Scotland, and in Scotland converted to the Presbyterian faith. And when they heard that their relatives in India were coming to Trinidad, they also came to Trinidad as Scottish Presbyterians. So the arrival of East Indians is the arrival of Hindus, Muslims, and Christians that give us this great cultural mix that is Trinidad and Tobago. And I ask, where would we be without Diwali? Where would we be without Pagwa, Peter Pak? Where would we be without Eid al-Fitr? and Eid al-Adha, especially in this month of Ramadan. But Mr. Speaker, uh, Deputy Speaker, what is more important with these peoples of different ethnicities and different cultures is the values of these religious festivals, the values that all these different peoples have brought to Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Arrival Day, as we celebrate it now, has a lot to do with nation building. A nation building, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is not a journey. It's a journey, sorry, not a destination. We have not yet arrived as a nation. We are still going along that path. And I want to say that we should be counting our blessings, that we could do so and be able to express ourselves as descendants of Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, as we give voice and wing to our watchwords, discipline, production, and most importantly, tolerance. We as human beings with human frailties only have temporary dominion over matters of state. All of us here, temporary dominion over matters of state. On the way to nation building, there will be days of very smooth passage, but it may be punctuated by times of tempest. What will define us, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as a people of Indian origin, also as we mix with people of African origin, European origin, and Chinese origin, in this great social experiment we call Trinidad and Tobago, is how we deal with times of tempest, how we celebrate our manifest differences bequeathed to us by our Indian forefathers who as people of different ethnicities cross the dark walkers, waters in the same ship. They cross those waters on the same ships as brothers and sisters, looking for that new arrival as I spoke to earlier, that new dawn, that new beginning. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is why the words of our national anthem, here every creed and race find an equal place is so important as we celebrate Arrival Day today. Yeah. And it is the only words in the anthem here every creed and race find an equal place mentioned twice. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I close, I want to refer to the original meaning of arrival, a new dawn. And in the words of someone called Cat Stevens, who became known as Yusuf Islam, when he wrote a song called Morning Has Broken, he quoted in that song, like the first morning. Let the first dawn that the first indentured laborer saw and all its possibilities 
be akin to the morning that we, as their descendants, will see tomorrow, full of possibilities. Congratulations to our Indian brothers and sisters, and I thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I now recognize the Leader of the Opposition, the Member of the Department. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I must say my colleague is resplendent today, but I will not dwell. I endorse some parts of what he said. Um, uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to bring greetings to those of us gathered here and to the National Committee on the Occasion of Indian Arrival Day. We celebrate on Wednesday 173 years when the first group of immigrants arrived in our shores. They began a period of indentureship in the hope of providing a better future for themselves and for their children. It was a vision which they lived and ensured and labored to make it a reality. Today, their children and grandchildren <coughs> occupy positions and have successfully pursued careers which have contributed in no small manner to the building of the nation of Trinidad and Tobago. It is amazing that though many of them could not read nor write, they knew the importance of education as a pathway out of poverty and for success. On that first journey in 1845, about 200 Indian women, men, and children came on that first voyage uh, with the Fatal Rasa, and thereafter tens of thousands arrived. And I am told that when they disembarked, when they came off the, um, the ship, they bowed in reverence, humility, modesty, and character. They prostrated and said, touching the earth, Jai Tharati Mata. Jai means victory. Tharati means land. And of course, my mother. Jai, victory to the motherland. These were the Hindus. They did this as they pledged their allegiance to Mother Trinidad and Tobago. Our Muslim brothers and sisters performed Salat, signaling that whilst they turn to the east, they have not forgotten the values of the Holy Land Mecca, no matter how far away they will, were. Today, this remains, remains for me the foundation for the values of those who came out of India and settled here, and the descendants of those ancestors in Trinidad and Tobago. And the foundation is that of values, principles, and teachings. Madam, uh, Madam, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when they came, and as I said, they prostrated themselves and uh, swore allegiance to Tartima. Thereafter, they didn't know the hardships that they would have to endure, the inhumane conditions on the plantations. And the question then arises, why do we celebrate Indian arrival when it is that they arrived in, to work in such really harsh and humane conditions. Why? Why should we pay respect for this? And I think it is because of what our ancestors demonstrated, the indomitable will, the enduring spirit of those who came out of India throughout those years and their descendants thereafter. That is most admirable, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and worthy of celebration. Whilst we celebrate that endurance, spirit, and courage, for us who observe this day, it is a most important reminder to us of the value of gratitude. We are what we are today because of their sacrifices. We must live in an attitude of gratitude to them. A nation which doesn't have gratitude toward the ancestry will certainly be a poorer nation. Many died in the harsh conditions, but they used every means those who survived to so survive. And it is difficult for us, I think, to grasp the very horrific conditions in which they existed and managed to eke out a living. But perhaps the one redeeming factor, and I think my colleague did mention this, and Joseph, was the struggle to keep their culture, their dress, their language, and their religions. <clears throat> and they came, when they came, with the holy books which guided them and which still guide them today, many of them. 
And so the Hindus came with the Ramayana and the Muslims came with the Quran, the two holy books of those who came to Trinidad and Tobago, and some the Christians who came with their Bible. But the majority were with the Quran and with the Ramayana. And that was their most um, fundamental philosophy and principle guiding light in terms of living their lives. Their most precious institution was the family. And they made education the cornerstone of family life so that the children could escape the drudgery which had characterized their own lives. They stayed in Trinidad because they saw an opportunity to own land, to grow crops, to practice religion, to educate their children in many ways, recreate the homes they had left behind. As they became free from their contracts, Relationships that began on the voyages across the oceans were consolidated, and bonds that were created were strong and lasting. They created a community characterized by sharing and togetherness, based on respect for one another. It was a place where they nurtured generations of responsible men and women. When we look at their legacy, the legacy of our forefathers, who lived through the struggle of indentorship and took the decision to make this land their home, we must certainly celebrate Indian arrival in Trinidad and Tobago. We celebrate the incorporation of the customs and traditions of their ancestral home into their new home, Trinidad and Tobago, in which they created a community that has blossomed into the greatness that we have today. We take pride in what, as a community, we have been able to achieve and the special contribution <coughs> to nation building. We celebrate the contributions of those persons who came from other countries, other ancestors, who have, who have all together given us the vibrant, multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-religious society that is Trinidad and Tobago. We celebrate and honor the sacrifices made by all of our ancestors from whence they came, because we have come from all the great countries of the world and from the great religious organizations and beliefs from across the world, making us so unique in what we are and who we are as a nation. And that is why, you know, I've said, let not our differences divide us. Let our differences unite us. And let us take delight in our differences and make sure that those do not divide us at all. As we celebrate this occasion, we must continue to work together to build a stronger, more prosperous future for our children and those after them. To return Trinidad and Tobago once more <coughs> to growth and prosperity and into a united nation, which can all feel very proud to call home. Madam, ma um, Mr. Speaker, today I look upon this land and I say, as I stand in the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, I say, Vande Mataram, Mother Trinidad and Tobago, I bow to thee, my mother, the land of my birth. I thank you very much. Honorable members, I too would like to extend warm greetings to our East Indian community on the occasion of Indian Arrival Day. The East Indian immigrants brought with them their rich and vibrant culture, festivals, music, cuisine, and religions, which are ingrained into the very social fabric of Trinidad and Tobago. Not only is Indian Arrival Day a national holiday, it is also a day of commemoration and reflection in recognition of the history and struggles of these courageous people. On behalf of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, I take this opportunity to wish you a happy and peaceful Indian Arrival Day 2018. We will now have greetings on Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi is a celebration of the institution of the Holy Eucharist and is significant by special displays of devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. I will now call upon members to express greetings on the occasion of the Feast of Corpus Christi. I will now recognize the Acting Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Feast of Corpus Christi 
also known as the Feast of the Body of Christ, is celebrated on the eighth day, eighth Thursday after Easter. <laughs> I think I better give a little appreciation of the seasons of the church so we can understand Corpus Christi in context. In the Catholic Church, the first season of the Catholic Church is Advent, which begins four Sundays before Christmas and literally means the coming. Then we have the season of Christmas, which is the celebration of the birth of Christ. After the season of Christmas, we have the Epiphany, celebrating the visit of the wise men to the infant Jesus. Following the Good Friday and Easter uh, celebrations, we have the season of Lent. And after Lent is over, sorry, we, we, we go to Lent, and then after that, we have the season of Easter. If, for those of us who went to church yesterday, you'd have been aware that yesterday was the celebration of the Trinity. So yesterday was Trinity Sunday. And Trinity, the Trinity is one of the most difficult concepts in the Catholic religion to, and the Christian religion to comprehend. But following Trinity Sunday, that brings us to an end of the Easter season in the Catholic Church. And immediately after Trinity Sunday, on the Thursday after Trinity Sunday, we have the celebration of Corpus Christi, which is the celebration of the body of Christ. And if I move now to a little illustration of exactly what it is. The celebration of Corpus Christi celebrates the presence of the body and blood of Christ, one of the sacraments of the Eucharist. According to Christian religion, on Holy Thursday, the day preceding his death, Jesus met the apostles for the Last Supper when he said, this is my body, pointing to the bread, and this is my blood, pointing to the wine. Catholics around the world acknowledge the gift of the Eucharist and they believe that God is food of the soul. In the Corpus Christi celebration, there are three purposes. Honoring Jesus Christ, asking for forgiveness from Jesus for what was done to him, and protesting against those who deny the presence of God. In Trinidad and Tobago, we celebrate Corpus Christi with a solemn mass which will be celebrated this year at the Grand Stand in Port of Spain, following which there will be a procession to the courtyard of the cathedral on Independence Square. And all Catholics who are devout Catholics participate in this procession from the Savannah to the cathedral downtown. This is a feast of in, in immense importance to Catholics. We celebrate the host, we celebrate the meaning of the Eucharist, we celebrate the Last Supper, and we celebrate the transubstantiation of the body of Jesus Christ. So on behalf of the People's National Movement government, and on my own, be, own behalf, I, I want to give the most holy expression to this Christian celebration to all Christians in Trinidad and Tobago and all others who will join with Christians in celebrating the Feast of the Eucharist, the Feast of Corpus Christi. I thank you, Mr. Well, Deputy uh, Speaker. I will now recognize the member for Naparima. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to bring greetings to the Roman Catholic community of Trinidad and Tobago on the commemoration of Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. Roman Catholicism in our country is a direct, a byproduct of the strong Catholic influence as a consequence of the cedula of population in 1783, which opened Trinidad and Tobago to immigration from the French Caribbean islands. And this brought about an enrichment of the tapestry, cultural and otherwise, of our, of, of our culture. It brought names like, like the Pantins, like the Dilabastids, like the Dupres, the Imberts, the Montai, and the Devotais, who have enriched our country and contributed significantly. The most sacred <laughs> event in the Roman Catholic calendar celebrates the tradition and belief in the body and blood of Jesus Christ and his real presence in the Holy Eucharist. 
Corpus Christi is primarily celebrated by the Roman Catholic Church, and in some countries where Catholicism is one of the dominant religions, it is celebrated as a national holiday. We are blessed in Trinidad and Tobago to have people of strong faith and a nation in which many religions, ethnicities, and cultures live together in, in harmony. Locally, one of the traditions of Corpus Christi is planting seedlings of trees as it is considered a good time for the activity as it is believed that anything planted on this day will, tr will thrive. For me, I look forward to spending Sorry, I look forward, I have fond memories of spending Corpus Christi with my late father and my brothers planting pigeon peas and corn and later sharing the fruits of our labor. I'm sure that many families share such experiences and memories. In my case, my father was strict, a schoolmaster, and it was activities like this built around events like Corpus Christi that bonded our family together. We must always, let us ensure that we strengthen the values of mutual respect and trust that and deepen the bonds of friendship among all citizens in our country. Just as the belief that planting on this day brings the best harvest, so too must we consider that devotion on this day will renew our strong nationhood and unity. We must always put God in front and follow him in all that we do and all that we hope to accomplish individually and as a nation. On behalf of the opposition, the United National Congress, I extend Corpus Christi greetings to the Roman Catholic community and all citizens of our country. May God bless our nation. Honorable members, on behalf of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, I too, would like to extend warm greetings to our Catholic community and to all citizens of our nation on the occasion of the Feast of Corpus Christi. I urge us all to embody the compassion and sacrifice of Jesus Christ and to be the body of Christ for each other. Indeed, it is my hope that as we continue the local tradition of planting on this day, that we also plant and nurture the seeds of love patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I wish you all a holy and joyful Feast of Corpus Christi. Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to a date to be fixed. All in favor say aye. Any against? The ayes have it. In accordance with standing orders 11 and 12-1, this house now stands adjourned to a date to be fixed. <laughs>